Well, hello, hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We're going to be continuing the slime experiments and developing some more stuff. So, previously made a list of the different things that I wanted to cover or that I had to do in order to finish the game. Well, not necessarily finish, but at least some steps that we could take to uh, get a little bit closer to that. Let's start by adding some music. Okay, so I'll switch over. In the time it took for the, the intro to start, I went ahead and uh, started up Unity. I don't have to wait for the minute or so it took to load here. So here's our list of things that we wanted to do in order to do, I'm gonna make this smaller so y'all aren't blinded by the whiteness of it. Um, so. Last time I had made a zero entry, which was adding some other elements, uh, like a lever and stuff like that. I did that. That's all good to go. I also updated the blocks that we'll be adding in just a moment. But here's the list. So today we're going to be focusing on adding in the new things that I created, making them work to an extent. And then I think what we'll do is make the, uh, the settings menu the main menu quit prompt and the quit game prompt that we're going to be going into here. And then maybe start on the main menu so we have that area complete. But uh, we'll kind of see how things go, see how long it takes me to implement the things that I'm going to be implementing. But we'll be off for now. So <clears throat> let's get this off the screen. And we'll go ahead and just start importing the assets that we have here. So. We'll go ahead and I think I can just do this. I was hoping I could just like overwrite it, but I can't. We'll just delete this wall block like we did last time. And that gets rid of that. And the tile palette has disappeared now, so we can go ahead and just drag this. Oh wait, we have to cut it first. Step ahead of myself. Multiple quality point. And we'll go 32 here and apply. Right editor. Once again, we're going to be doing 32 by 32 for the size. 32 by 32. And I'll explain these here uh, as we go. So I've made the thickness of the outer border a little bit thicker. It's now three pixels wide instead of like one to two. So I'm hoping that'll reflect a little bit better. Uh, I made over here, it's like a pitfall. If the player goes into it, they're going to just be teleported back to the start of the uh, like spawn area. Simple as that. And then these are the movable blocks that have been pushed into the holes. So you can walk over the pitfalls, essentially. Um, those will be implemented at some point. This is for like up and down movement. This from side to side. You can kind of see the difference in color in these. But that's that. We then have the uh, like just straight sides and ceiling and floor area. We have uh, corner pieces for the corners. And then these are gonna be the exits. They have like a little red arrow pointing, like this is where you wanna go to exit the room to get to the next level. And then over here, we have the gates, which are gonna be used for like levers or pressure plates or things like that that are gonna stop your progress unless they're triggered. And then we have the closed gates here for like up, down, left, right. The open gates where they just disappear. Uh, so that's what this all is. We'll hit apply, go back to our tile palette, I'm gonna drag this over, and we want to do 100 tile maps this time. Select that folder, and everything will build in there. Nice and easy. In addition to that, we have our. Oops. Other things, which I'll just grab right now and put them all in. <clears throat> we have our immobile block, which I made red to signify that it's not movable, because red means stop. We have a lever, we have our movable block, and we have a pressure plate. Let's get all this stuff sort of in here, but first, why don't we make our new level area here? So let's start with the left side. Drag down here, and we'll do the 
bottom border, then the right side, and then the top. And then we can use the corner piece to make it a nice little box. Now if we get play, we can get rid of the grid lines. And we can kind of see a little bit better that we're kind of nice and closed in here. Perfect. Okay. So that's done. We can also slap down a level. This is just a test area. It doesn't matter right now. So. Now let's go ahead and get the movable block working again. It should be very simple. All we have to do is first of all, select all of these. Oops, select all of these, I said. And we need to set these all to have the same attributes here. Perfect. Then we can select the movable block and just drag our new sprite into this one and pop. There it is. It's, it's done and ready to go. Uh, let's just check the hitbox on this bad boy. You can see it's a little bit bigger than the block, so let's go ahead and make that different. I made it a little bit smaller than a uh, 32 by 32. That way, uh, it doesn't get like stuck on walls and stuff. Like if there's a one block gap, just think of the world in like 32 by 32 blocks, right? So we just don't want that to happen. So that's that there. I don't have anything else to do with that one right now. Let's get the immovable block, which is a little bit bigger as you can see. That's fine. So we want to add a, a box collider. And we'll go ahead and put this one around this guy as well. Easy peasy. And I guess the question is, if I hit play, I should be able to move the movable block, but is it gonna just stop when it hits this? Okay, perfect. I wasn't sure if I needed a, a mobile, not a mobile, a uh, rigid body for the immovable block or not. Essentially the immovable block our immobile block. It's just going to be like a piece of the background, except something that's going to be a game object. So it's not going to have anything tied to it. I'm just going to copy it down here. And let's go ahead and just move it kind of off to the side here. Move the event system up there. Okay. Next up, we need to add in the pressure plate. As you can see, it's like a uh, same color as the cube that you move, but it's a little bit darker and has an X on it for X marks the spot, right? So that, that's my hope anyway. We're gonna, once again, uh, add a box collider. However, this one is not gonna be just a normal collider. It's going to be a trigger option. And we wanna make it a little bit smaller than the actual thing here. Easy peasy. And then we also need to change the default sorting layer to above background. Because this, uh, if we lift it as default, anything that's also on default would interfere with it, which I don't think would matter. Speaking of, the mobile block needs to be changed as well. So let's open that up real quick. This one's gonna be, let's have it be character level, just for the sake of things. So the pressure plate, it's going to be above background so that way characters can move on top of it. Because if I hit play, for example, I'll be able to run over top of it. I'll be able to push the block on top of it. Easy as that, right? Simple. OK, now we have the pressure plate kind of made. Uh, we'll get into the actual scripting of it here in a moment, but first, let's also get the lever out here so that we have it. It's a little bit big. What if we resize it to 0 0.5? Hmm. 
want to be a little bit bigger than the slime because it was made by a human or a scientist who was not a slime. So that's about right, I think. Well, we can go with that. So the idea is for the lever, I didn't make different versions for like on off because what I'll do is I'll just do scale, switch to negative and just positive. So we can just kind of do this sort of thing in order to have it be on or off. And the left is the default off, right is gonna be the default on. So that's all we really gotta do. We don't have to go through with animations. If I wanted to, I could make like a uh, an actual animation for it and make a sprite where there's a shift of it going to the middle and then ending at the left. And then I could, you know, just implement that as I wanted to. But I think one sprite will do for now. If I wanna get a little more detailed with it, I can do that later. All right, so we have these. We need to add a box collider here, however, but we don't want the player to be able to walk over the pressure plate. So we'll just do that, or over the uh, thing here. But I do want the player to be able to walk behind it because it's a lever and it's just kind of sticking up in the sky. So now if we hit play, I can just kind of walk behind it. And you can see I kind of get obscured by the uh, lever and I can't move it, which is great. And the cube should also hit this. Boop, easy. All right, excellent. However, we also need to add one more thing to this and that is going to be a hitbox. So let's go ahead and get a circle collider. And that's gonna be is trigger. Go ahead and it is a little bit bigger here. Basically what this is going to do, anytime someone's in this little area um, and they do something, which is going to be pressing the F key, basically it's going to toggle the lever and do whatever I want it to do. So that's what that's going to do. So with that, pretty much everything there. So we're going to add a component to this called, well actually instead of adding it there, what I should do is go to scripts, object scripts, Create lever script. And let's create a pressure. Oops, hold on. Pressure plate script. Perfect. And the mobile block does not need one because it, it's just going to be a blocker. It's not going to have anything associated with it, right? Okay. Uh, so. Let's then assign these lever script and pressure plate script. And I think at this point, I can go ahead and just add these to my prefabs because there's not gonna be anything that I need them uh, for out in the rest of the area. So perfect. Okay. So we have, this one already has the trigger, right? Just double checking, excellent. Let's go ahead and we will open both of these up. That way we can work at them at the same time. Excellent. All right, so we don't really care about the update at the moment. So the pressure plate is going to activate something. So we wanna do serialized field, game object, um, we can do one of two things with the pressure plate. We can have it just immediately disable and change something, or just sort of like add something. So I think what we'll do is we'll do object to, or let's go with uh, object ridge in now, and then we'll do object to change to, we'll also add a object to manipulate. Just for the future, I'm not sure what all I'm gonna use a pressure plate and the lever for. However, um, we can do for a couple of things. So the first one here, original and to change, um, think of it like the gate, right? Um, how I had the gate was Open up the tile map here. So with the, the gates down here, I had it so this 
would be the normal gate. So this is like the, the original, right? And then this one would be to change to. So if you hit the pressure plate, it will swap the gate sprite out for the open sprite that you can just kind of walk through. And that's what that would do. And then object to manipulate, for example, um, if you hit that, it could say just spawn a cube or something like that, right? Think of it like a resetting a puzzle. So if you like get a block stuck or something, you can hit the button to reset it. Like that, right? So we then want to do a serialized field boolean. Um, we want to do is one object. What this will do is it'll tell us if we're doing two or one. Simple as that. So if is one object equals true, it's going to only do the object to manipulate. Otherwise, if it's false, it's going to do object original object change. Then we have some logic there to know what exactly we're doing. Um, easy peasy, right? So after that, we need to do on trigger enter to D because we want to see if something enters the thing. And then we also want a on trigger exit 2D. So for the exit condition, this one's really only going to be if is one object equals true because, or false, I mean. Because the toggle is going to be that. So if this something goes on the pressure plate, then goes off of it, um, we want that to sort of change what happens. Um, on enter, however, what we need to do is we need to do, first of all, if collision dot game object dot tag equals What should I name this? Like, what, what, what was the uh, movable blocks? So, movable block is what we want to call it. Okay, so. Just wanted to make sure because before it was movable object. So, movable block or. Collision equals player. Honestly, do I need this? If you think about it, the only thing that's going to be able to activate it is indeed the player or the movable block, or in some cases, it's going to be the um, enemy who's chasing you that could potentially trigger it. But I don't think we necessarily need to worry about this. We don't have to check. It's fine. All we want to do is check if is one object equals true. Do that. Otherwise, do that. Okay. Perfect. We have that set up. So what do we want to do? Um, if there is one object, well, we want to manipulate the object. But how? I guess it depends upon what the object we're going to be manipulating is, right? So... If I were to do... Object... Or... No, object... To... To manipulate... Dot tag? Right, okay, so let's do string obj equals that. Because there might be multiple things we want to do. Maybe we just want to toggle one thing, like make it active or hide it. 
maybe we want to um, spawn something in, make it active, you know, so it kind of depends. The various things we could do, and it all really depends upon what we want. So we would want to make a switch object case. Movable block. Okay. So, if it's a movable block, basically, we would want to, I guess, spawn it in, right? So, in addition to this, we would want to make a serialized field with a game object called location to spawn. That way, we will have a specific location to spawn the item at. Right? Um, let's see. So the question is, though, I don't want them to be able to just repeatedly tap the button and spawn in like a dozen blocks all on top of each other. Because that could cause some issue. So I would need to... Huh. Is there a... So if I do object to men... Got it. OBJ to manipulate dot is collide. Nope. Uh, get component box collider 2D dot is. Hmm. What's is touching? Check whether collider is touching the collider or not. This collider is touching the collider. What does that mean? Oh, is touching and then... Right. I'm trying to find if there's a way to just check to see if there's like another object that is touching in the area. I guess I could go like is touching. Hold on. So is touching and then you do another 2D collider. So <sighs> this is a tough one. I guess what I could do is make an array of all objects, of all the movable block objects, that is, and see if any of them is touching by using the collider like that. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that for now. Because that should be a true or false statement, right? Okay. We'll get to that in a moment. What we want to do with the multi-block is first of all, we want to do game object block equals instantiate object to manipulate. That'll create a new instance of the uh, block. I think I can actually put location to spawn dot transform dot position. Is that no, it's just transform, is it? Okay. So 
I think that will spawn the block in at the location. Okay. However, uh, before we do that, what I might want to do is do... Is it a list or an array? Let's, let's do list game object uh, active blocks equals and then game object dot find game objects with tag movable block. Is that what I want to do? Cannot convert type game object to system generic list game object. Oh, because it's object. I want objects. However, yeah, that's a an array. Okay. How do I create an array? Is it just game object? array like that yeah i don't really use arrays all that often but here's our array so first we're going to find all the game objects with the uh, tag movable block that way we'll know what their positions are and whatnot then we're going to generate the new game object at that location and then we want to check if active blocks dot length is greater than zero, so that's to say if there are any active blocks currently there, uh, we want to do something, right? So if active blocks is greater than, we want to go through for each game object block in active blocks. We'll just go ahead and take a suggestion there. We want to check so we want to do if object to manipulate that is touching block dot get component and then we want to do box collider to d boop and if that equals true we don't want to do oh well, i guess what we want to do is we want to do um is it destroy block because that would destroy the block we just created and then break So basically what this does is we're going to say find all currently active movable blocks. Then we're going to create the new block to be spawned. Then we're going to check to see if the previously active blocks were more than zero in total. If they were, loop through all of them and check to see, or just loop through all of them. Down in here, check to see if the newly spawned block is touching any of the old blocks and then if the new block touches the old block destroy it as it shouldn't be allowed to spawn easy the only question is is this going to happen quick enough to prevent some stuff moving around i think Right, so we'll just kind of have to see what happens. Uh, 
kind of go from there. So let's just hit save real quick, and we'll save on that one too, just for the heck of it. So set that aside. You have the pressure plate. Let's go ahead and add a couple of things to this. So we want to do movable block. Uh, this is going to be object to manipulate. Also, I didn't actually put the sprite in the correct location. Just one moment. Here we go. I, I changed the uh, item in the game world and not the prefab for the, the movable block. So that's why it was not showing uh, an icon down here. So what else in the pressure plate do we need? We need a location to spawn. So we're going to create an empty location. And this is just going to be a, a point in the world. And we're going to call this spawn point. And be done with that. Okay. So pressure plate now needs to take that spawn point. We want to select the box that says is one object. Then if we hit play, it should spawn a block over there. Let's check that out. It did. Now if we go back across it, Okay, so for some reason, it just created another one and didn't actually check to see. Kind of interesting how I can just keep doing this, though. That could be a useful feature if I wanted to uh, kind of start flooding the room with stuff, but that's not what we want to do. Okay, so what happened? Well, we're going to need to check to see if these things all had movable block attached to them. Movable block. I spelled it right in here, correct? I think so. All right, so when you don't really know what to do, and you're not curious, and you're curious, like, why is this not working? What we want to do is do some debugs. So debug.log. And let's just do active blocks.length. That way we can actually see is the active blocks thing actually loading in. Um, then we'll know if we're getting down through here. But then we can do. Oh, I think I see. Okay. Because it's spawning and it's immediately moving things out of the way, we do not have a chance to actually see the touching because it's it's not touching because they're moving each other out of the way. So that's the issue. But just for the sake of things, we will go ahead and do a debug just to see what the length is because it should be increasing every time we like touch the thing, right? So over here, length is one, length is two. Length is three. Length is four. You can always see it, it's going one behind every single time we do it, because we already had one block, which was one, and then the new one spawning after this script happens. So, yeah. So it's working. It's just not working as intended because the things are getting moved out of the way. So we need to do a different way for this. I guess what we could do is instead of spawning the block and destroying it, which honestly, that was pretty stupid, we can add a box collider 2D to our thing here. This is just going to be a, an is trigger, I think. Because if it's not an is trigger option, I won't be able to do anything. I won't be able to move past that spawn point, which is not what I want. So what I'll do here, let's hit save. That way it saves the information. So rather than spawning the block here, we're going to move it down to here. Actually, we might move that a little bit later as well, but that's either here or there. So 
first, get all active blocks in the field, right? Then, if active blocks is greater than zero, we do all that nonsense. However, if there are no active blocks, we can just automatically go ahead and create a new block to be spawned since there are no other blocks. Okay. Then yes, we want to loop through all the active blocks. However, what we want to do is not that. We want to do Instead of object to manipulate, we want to do the uh, location to spawn dot box glider 2D uh, is touching. Now, I'm not sure if is touching will work since it is a trigger. Right? We'll have to see if that works. And we'll just do debug dot log. It is indeed touching. Okay. So that'll happen. Easy peasy. Let's actually set this to one for right now. Because I don't want to delete our current moving block, but I also want this thing to trigger at least once. So <clears throat> let's see how it goes. So first block, trigger, perfect. Second, it is indeed touching. Okay. Which means it's not going to spawn one. Love to see it. Okay. That works for spawning one block and then having nothing else spawn. But what if there's already a block active in the scene and it's not overriding, right? Well, then what we're going to do is create a private bool is touching equals false. Okay. What we're going to find here is if all this happens and it encounters any one block that is touching, we want to do is touching equals true. And we just want to get out. We don't care about doing any more loops. We just want to check for one and say, oh, hey, this block is indeed touching. Then after all this goes through, after the for each, we can then say if is touching equals false, we want to do that. We want to actually create the block, right? Which we don't actually need to have this stuff now because we're not going to be using the block variable anywhere. Save. So we want to check to see if the block that will be spawned is touching, uh, will be touching, will be touching any of the old blocks. If it will touch, set the bool to true. And finally, if no current blocks were in the area, spawn a new block. Easy peasy. So now, what we should do, we can hit our uh, fun little Keep forgetting to hit the play button. We'll hit our fun little pressure plate, hit it again, hit it again, nothing happens. But if we move this out of the way and hit it again, why didn't it work? Oh, I know why. In our code, we don't set it to false again. So, if touching equals false, else is touching equals true. Or 
Awesome. Right. So, if we go through this and his touching is true, we're then gonna come down to here and set his touching back to true, or back to false, so that something could potentially in the future be spawned again. Because now we have something to kind of trigger that back and forth. So hit this, push this out of the way, trigger this again, and it spawns. There we go. We can also just double check that going over this is not going to do anything. Let's go ahead and push this out of the way. And let's just check to make sure that if we push this block on top of the pressure plate, it also triggers. However, it triggered at a uh, very early point. I'm going to trigger it again just because I'm doing this. Damn it. Okay. So it triggers here. So I can make the pressure plate a lot smaller for the hitbox. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, that way it doesn't trigger as often or as soon because we want the block to actually get like all the way on it. So let's just do with a very center, a nice little square like that. So that should work. And if we back, hit play, we'll push the block down and it'll, it'll be mostly on the uh, pressure plate there. See, has to get at least halfway on for the pressure plate to count it. Perfect. Okay. That is one thing done. Cool, cool, cool. So, that'll handle the movable block case. Oh, I can't just collapse a specific case. Okay, let's make a region move block case. And then, boop. End region, move block case. So regions are really nice if you're dealing with a lot of code and in a short area and you don't have a way to like do that to it. Because a region will allow you to specify between this point and this point. I want to make a, uh, a way to break the code in Visual Basic. Uh, not Visual Basic, what is this? Visual Studio. And make it so that the uh, thing can be closed. That way you don't have to look at all this code to scroll down, you know, that piece works. That's all we care about. So next, we want to make a case for... What else is there? I guess I'll call it enemy. And let's make a private Google is spawned equals false. And for this one, we'll make it a little easier, okay? We're not gonna check and spawn a bunch of them in. What we'll do is we'll just check if is spawned equals false, then we want to spawn the enemy in. So we'll do instantiate object to manipulate at location to spawn dot transform push and then we'll do is spawned equals true. Okay. So that's really the only cases I can think of right now where if we only have one object in here, what we would want to do with it, right? We can either spawn a block or spawn an enemy. Um, either of those are what would happen, right? So that being the case, we can move on to the else block here. Um, Right, so for this one, if we enter, we're just gonna toggle. That's all we wanna do. 
So what we will do here is we want to do object original dot set active equals false and then object to change to dot set active is true. Easy as that. That's all we have to do if we have multiple objects selected. Very simple. Um, and then if we leave the pressure plate, we can just, I don't know why I deleted that. I just need to switch the true false to true false. That one and then this one. Oh, I do want the false to happen first, I think. Doesn't really matter to an extent. Okay, so basically what this does is if we have uh, multiple objects that we're going to be manipulating here, we are going to set the first one to false and then change the new one to active. And an example of this would be the gate. So let's go ahead and make a gate, why not? So we will, in our map here, why don't we add a little bit of some stuff here. So let's do that one, do that one, and then I can add a one. Unfortunately, that's not how that's going to work, is it? Um, how do I want to do this? I guess I can just do that and that for now. And then we can take not those. Ah, I do not have a uh, a tube thing here, but that's fine. We can just do this, just to make it a, a thing we can actually just use for now. I was gonna make more of a, a level kind of thing here, but that's fine. Don't worry about it. Okay, so we've made that a little area we cannot go through. But we need to make it so we have our gates here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to throw these into here. Why did that one, like, go in so nicely? But this one's like, I'm not going to conform to your location. That was odd. Is it because I selected it first and then drug it in? No? Seriously, why did this one, like, snap into the location? Weird. Anyway, let's ignore that for now. So these are all going to be our our gates, right? Let me get that so you can see which one I'm selected on. Okay. This one's going to be open. This one's going to be closed. This one's going to be open. This one's going to be closed. So let's rename these to something better. So open gate vertical. Closed gate vertical. We want to do closed gate horizontal. And then open gate horizontal. Okay. So now, now we need to add hitboxes to these. So I think I can add multiple box colliders. First, I can do that one there. That one there. Okay. We have that. But with that, I think we have this. We want to do all these on the same level as the character. There we go. Okay. Now, I'm just going to copy these. Can I just copy the components and then paste it here? How do I paste? Nope, that's not what I want to do. Add component, can I? Paste in here. I know I've done this before at some point, 
I don't remember how, though. Hmm, whatever, we'll just add more. It's fine. I'll just do it all manually. Man, in my uh, RPG game, before I learned that I could just hitbox the walls as I was placing them, for the first, like, five maps, I was doing this to every single border of the world. It was a bad time. A real, real bad time. Um, like, I'm talking, I was taking probably an hour or two per level to adjust the hitboxes around the outside of the level so the player couldn't get out. So I'd make like empty um, things, like we have this pawn point being empty. And I would make a uh, box collider in it and I would just like resize it to be like, okay, this is gonna be from like here to here and make one hitbox there. I would have to do so many of those because it was like a uh, forest level, right? And in the forest level, it had a bunch of trees that were all not exactly square. So I would have to like finagle them around and stuff. It was just awful. Especially since it was a uh, like a lime green on a lime green background, and that sucked quite a lot. All right, so let's actually add the hitbox for the gate as well. Why not? Let's just do another box collider. Okay, one more box collider here. And whoosh. okay, there we go. So now, if you look at all these, they all have hitboxes on them. <clears throat> Perfect. So <coughs> none of this really matters. So what we'll do now is in our prefabs, I can just copy all these down here. They shouldn't have anything attached to them, I don't think. So that's all gonna be fine. So it is a little hard to see. The, uh, the actual gate in there, isn't it? Whatever, it's fine. Okay, so with these gates here, I don't care about the vertical. Also, I spelled vertical wrong, god damn it. Let's get rid of the vertical ones for now. Um, let's rename them here so it's actually vertical, not vertical name and then this one as well save rename file what's that error and layout group begin layout group must be called first i don't even know what the hell that means all right so what we'll do now is we'll take these uh things here and we can just kind of slap them down in the thing here. I can actually turn on snap to grid and I can have it increment perfectly here. I can also change this so it's uh, 32 like that. Is this what I want to change? 32 right here? Nope. No, it's not. It's way too many. Look at that. Okay. Let's change that back to uh, <clears throat> one, I guess. Okay. It looks like we need 0.5 to be exact here. So 0.5. Now I should be able to just snap it right in there, right in the middle. Perfect. And this one as well, we're going to slap it down right here. We want the open gate to be inactive, and the other gate will be active. So we can do that. Next, we want to grab the pressure plate, and we want to put the closed gate in the original object, and the gate to change into that object. 
Easy peasy. <clears throat> okay, so now let's hit play. So first things first, we can see that, oh, I, I can't pass through here. Also, it might be because my hitbox is too big, but it's either here or there. Maybe I should remove the edge bits and uh, just have a gate. It might be more intelligent. But regardless, let's go ahead and push this down. Oops. Uh, why did that not work? Oh, I know why. Because I'm smart. And I did not uncheck that box. Okay. Letter face palm. So we move that down. You can see that the gate switched open. However, I can't fit through because the hitbox is too big. If you look here, I'll just grab everything. You can see my hitbox is a little bit too big to fit in there if I go down a little bit. Still just a little bit too big. I could probably fit perfectly if I uh, really tried, but fortunately that's not going to do it. Now is it? Which is unfortunate. So, so unfortunate. I could adjust the hitboxes so I could go through, but then I think if I was moving, I would start clipping through them. Not what you want to do. I mean, let's just try it. Let's just see what happens, right? Let's do the open gate. And we'll grab the box colliders here and we'll make them go like that. That should give us more than enough room to go through, right? We'll hit save. And then, uh, let's, let's do that above background. Let's just see what happens here. So we'll hit play again. And we will push the block onto the pressure plate. And then can we get through? We can. Yeah. Although when we jump, you can see I can kind of get through it. So it might be more opportune to just remove those. I don't know. We'll see. But if I remove the block, we can see that the gate comes back. And if I touch it, it just kind of goes back and forth. So perfect. That's all we need to do with that. And I think that's all we really have to do for the pressure plate. Uh, all that's really going to matter is that stuff. So the pressure plate is completed. Excellent. Um, I'm going to, for now as well, I'm going to edit this real quick. Uh, so the background, we'll adjust these so the player can fit through here as well. Ooh, excellent. Cool. I'm going to have to test those since they're going to work the exact same as these. Easy as that. So, next. Hmm, lever. First of all, let's bring up our thing here. Pressure plate added. Gates added. Great. <laughs> Anyway, so I think the lever is going to be quite similar to the pressure plate, right? So what we want to do, I'll go ahead and just copy these here, paste it into there. Because it's going to be a toggle regardless, so um, we want to do, instead of on... Uh, How do I do this? It would need to be private bool is colliding equals false. We're going to do the update. We're going to want to do on trigger enter 2D. Um, if collision.gameobject.tag equals layer is colliding equals true. Otherwise, we're not going to do anything. And then on 
trigger exit 2D, we want to do the opposite of this. Set it to false, so we're no longer colliding. Right? So that'll do if, if we're getting in the hitbox or out of the hitbox, so we can actually interact with it. Next, we want to check if is colliding equals true. We do that. However, go to our GM, because I need this. I always forget the syntax for that. And then if input dot key down, but we're going to do F, we want to trigger the change. So first, we want to take the lever and make it go on. So we'll make a private bool is activated equals false. And we'll do so if the hit up on it, it's going to be activated. So is activated turns to true. I guess I should check to see if it is activated or not. Right. So first of all, if is activated equals true else okay so for this it's going to if you flip the lever with f and it's already active it's going to turn false if it's already or if it's already false it's going to turn true right however we also need to adjust the scale and I think, let me just double check the size. Yep, so 0 0.75 for the scale. So I guess I could have just done this dot game object dot transform dot local scale. I don't think I can do, yeah, I, I can't do like individual changes like that, right? I can't just do, equals negative 0 0.75, right? Because you cannot re modify the return value of transform.local scale because it's not a variable. <laughs> right, so stupid. Anyway, what we can do is do <clears throat> float. Call it xval equals. We'll just do that. And then we'll do times negative one. And we can do xval here. No. I'm going to have to change the entire thing. Right. So. Uh, vector three new vect equals new vector three uh, xval zero zero well not zero 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 it should be zero point seven five point seven five go and then I think I can do new vect right okay. So much work for what could just be done in like one freaking line. So I think that's all we need. I think I just copy this to actually, do I need to have this twice? Because negative one times negative one is one. So I think I can just put this at the bottom regardless. Because it'll always, actually we'll do that first. Whenever you hit F on it, it's going to trigger it on and off, right? And we can just test that right now. We don't have to have any other code. Let's hit this. I'm gonna first walk away and then come back and move the lever and then boop, 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 boop. Yay, it works. Excellent, okay. So that's the thing turning on and off and the boolean for whether or not it's active or not is getting changed. So what we want to do next 
is I think just kind of do what we did to the pressure plate where we turn the things on or off, right? But I do at one point want to have a lever puzzle where it's kind of like a code where you have like three levers and you have to flip like them in a certain order to have them open up a gate. That would be neat. So I think I should do... Well... Oh, I know what I can do. Yeah. Instead of being like, okay, I have to make a program that like detects whether all the levers that you need to turn on on are on. I can just use this and put like six gates down or three levers, right? Three of them are the closed gates, three of them are the open gates. If the lever's in the correct position, it's going to have it be open. If it's in the wrong position, it's going to be closed. That way you're just like essentially enabling all the gates to the proper one that they should be. Yeah. Easy. Never mind. So if activated is false, we want to do or Right, so object original dot set active true. Object to change false. And we that opposite. Perfect. So I think that's everything we need to do for the lever. The lever is a lot more simple than the pressure plate. Okay, so let's test this out. First things first, we need to select our lever and we need to give it the closed and open gates. Let's hit play. And let's just flip the lever back and forth. Open, closed, open, closed, open, closed, open, closed. <gasps> it's beautiful. Excellent, this is exactly what we needed to do. So here we have a working lever. You can hit it from various angles from the side. Perfect. Oh, so perfect. It's, it's just beautiful. Okay. And with that, we have our levers added. Yay. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Excellent. So all of our new features um, have more or less been added um, now, so all of our new little thingy things have been added here, except for the pitfall, which we can do real quick here. So we're going to do this pitfall. We're going to grab a box collider, and this is going to be a trigger. We're going to make it really small like the pressure plate, but even smaller, I think. where I want it. That's not centered. Okay. That should be good. So, next we want to go to scripts. Um, let's see. I'll put the timer script in the manager thing here. And then in object scripts, we'll add a pitfall script. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> so let's just double check here. Pitfall, uh, pitfall script. And then let's add Real quick, I'm just gonna change something real quick so you guys don't have to see me go back and forth all the time. Serialized field, game object, uh, new path. I'm just gonna call it new path because we're just gonna drag something over real quick. So let's 
first of all, this is going to be a part of the background level. We're going to add that there. Go ahead and save. And then let's go to assets and we're going to grab the wall blocks here and here. And um, let's call it sealed pit wall horizontal. And this one is going to be sealed pit wall vertical. And these should also both be background. And these, these aren't going to have anything else on them. They're essentially just going to be tiles that you can walk over, right? So let's create a prefab of these. Because these are done. Boop, boop. Really hard to tell where the thing is at, right? So that's fine. All right. Let's go ahead and get rid of these and whatnot. So... For this one, let's just say it is a vertical one. That'll be our game object. And what we want to do in here is do on trigger enter 2D if I should do a switch for this. So we'll do string object equals collision dot game object dot tag go we'll do a switch object case layer oops that should be a colon and then case a movable block Excellent. Those are, could also be cases where it is an enemy. And we can also do that there. So let's let's do a case enemy. Right. The enemy one is going to be the same exact thing as the player. It's just going to send it back to the, the original spawn of the level. Right. So uh, let's also do a serialized field game object level spawn so we'll just do that i'll just use the same spawn as the uh other thing and so if the object that collides with the pitfall is the player we are going to do Collision dot game object dot transform dot uh, position equals level spawn dot transform dot position. And that should just really quickly teleport us over to that location. However, if it is a movable block that gets pushed in, the first thing that we want to do is do collision dot game object destroy. We're going to destroy the game object that touches it. Then, real quick, we're going to do uh, instantiate new path at this dot transform and then what we want to do last is this dot set this dot game object dot set active false so what this will do is if it is a movable block it's going to first of all destroy the movable block so that we can actually pass over it it's then going to create the new path game object where this thing was. And then it's going to destroy the pitfall so that it cannot trigger when the player tries to go over it. So let's see if this works how I think it will work. But first of all, we need to, of course, drag the spawn point 
over to here. And then hit play and we'll just go on as a player first, see what happens. As you can see, we spawned over here. Go in it again, spawn over there. That sucks. Okay. So I guess I can't go in that area because it's a pitfall. What if I push this block into it? Oh, look, it... Well, something happened. Um, it did not seem to instantiate the object, though. Hmm. That's unfortunate. Oh, I know why. Because it created it there. Okay. <clears throat> Got it. So I need to do game object uh, path equals that, and then I need path dot set. Uh, no, um, child. No. How did I do this? Um, path dot parent. How do I set a parent? I think it's path dot. Is it transform dot parent equals this? No, not this. How do I just? not have it have a parent. I guess I could do equals game object game object dot find game object with tag level dot that's more so what I can do here is we can add a new tag of this level because that might actually come in handy later having a, a level tag so this would be level so if we look and play now Instead of it being a child of the pitfall, it should become a child of the level, right? I forgot about that. Instantiate it. Hold on, let me let me just real quick. Was we doing the transform thing? Was that making it the child there? If I do that, <gasps> excellent. Okay, that's what I need to do. So <clears throat> rather than doing the level thing. We just want to change the position to be this dot transform dot position. There we go. Okay, so now if we play, I'll explain this a little better if we uh, actually get this to work this time. Hey, we did it. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. cool. Okay, so we didn't have to do any children, children, children or anything, so that's good. Okay. By the way, in the future, all of these uh, things that are outside here, they will be inside the level. So when I do inevitably um, 
switch levels, I can just delete whole levels instead of having to delete all this stuff itself. Anyway, that works. Let me explain why it works. So, yeah, if you do instantiate and then with the uh, thing I had behind it, like the pressure plate, I think, as the instantiate, yeah. It becomes a child of that thing. So actually, if I hit the pressure plate now, we can kind of see what happens. Oh, right. Let me uh, pressure plate. Oop, there we go. So you can see the, the new block is here, but it's becoming a child of the spawn point also is not what we want to have happen. I guess it does really matter in the long run. So... Doesn't matter. In, in this case, making them a parent or a child of the spawn point doesn't matter because the spawn point's never going to, like, die, right? Um, it's not going to be set inactive or deleted unless the entire level changes, in which case everything else is going to go away as well. We're fine there. Perfect. Okay. So I think that's all I need to do for the pitfall trap, too. Anything else that I added that we want to mess with now? There are the exits, which I could mess with. Although the exit's just going to be part of the wall, and I'll just put like a little space in it. Um, so what we could do, I guess, is uh, script, manager, create, uh, Finish level script. <clears throat> so, what this will do, well, first of all, uh, let's create a game object. I don't think I need a tag for it. That's fine. We do need a, I'll do a circle collider for this. So for example, if we were to move this over to here and let's go to the tile map real quick and I'll just add in this thing, for example. You know, let, let's, let's do that there actually. That way it's kind of through the gate anyway. And I can just kind of go And then let's just say we want to go like this, for example. Here we go. And then I could, I don't know, grab this. And we can go this one, actually. Sort of making a uh, an ending area. Why not? Okay. So, aside from not having a, a corner piece for that thing, that's fine. Or a corner piece for that thing, which is also fine. We essentially have a an exit here. So this would be like our level, for example. We got to get through the gate and get to the exit, right? So the end level thing would be in the wall here. I think the player could still touch that with their hitbox, potentially. 
should be first is trigger and we'll just go a little bit further here excellent okay so they should be able to definitely touch that now and what we can do here is do um end or i guess finish level script not that it matters because we're not going to be able to do anything without another level um, but with that done we can come over here and do on trigger oops wrong one on trigger enter 2d we want to check if the collision the game object dot tag equals player oops player then we want to do something uh, which would be probably uh private void and level okay bang there we go so the first thing we have to do i suppose hmm, is to serialize field game object current level so that'll be the current level that we're playing so that we can delete it at some point right so what else do we need to do when we hit this well we want to first of all set gm dot oops, let me actually state what gm is so gm gm awake uh, gm equals game object uh, find game object with tag gm dot get component gm that all right i should also, probably also make an event tracker at this point but we'll deal with that later so we want to do gm dot is loading equals true because we're then going to be loading in the next level, which hopefully is going to take like just a second to load, which is fine. But that's okay. So, in GM, in the update menu, what we want to do is we want to have if is loading equals true, else. We want to do, let's see, let's get a serialized field game object loading screen. So if loading is true, we want to do loading screen dot set active equals true. And if it's not loading, we want to do false. Easy, right? So that'll basically just Keep running and check. If we're loading, it'll throw up a loading screen. If we're not loading, it'll not load, right? So, first and foremost, what we should probably do is do that. Actually, you know what? What don't we do is loading first. And then we'll make this a coroutine. Start coroutine, and then what I need to do is... Ah. I.e. numerator and level. And then we want to do... What other one had a, a numerator? Auto-talking. Right. I always forget the, the way that this syntax thing here works. So we're going to wait a full second, regardless of what we're doing. For the load screen to come up and stay up for at least one second. Then we're going to do the rest of the stuff here that we need to do. Uh, so what do we need to do? We need to delete the level, obviously. We want to save the time cleared, obviously. Although we should do save the time cleared here. Save time because if we save the time cleared um, 
anywhere else, it, it would be a full second late to where you there. So we need to load the next level. If there is a next level. Well, if there's not a next level, I'd probably just make a new script called final level, I guess. We'll load the next level. Um, move character to spawn of level. And then delete the old level. Right. So, that's what we need to do here. So first of all, let's go back to our manager script. We're gonna create a script called event tracker. You know what, let's just call it ET, just for simplicity's sake. And I'm gonna add it to the GM here, so ET. All right, so I need to actually double click on that to open it up. So unlike our other things, which have methods and all that stuff in it, um, our event tracker is just going to be a list of variables and information, right? So let's do, first of all, string current level, okay? So we're gonna start them out by having absolutely no, uh, nothing inside of them, right? So our current level, this is gonna be the level that they're currently on. Um, it'll probably just hold like 1-1 one -one or something uh, for whatever reason. And then we wanna do string equals uh, new level time, which is going to equal another string. Actually, if we look at timer, ah, I moved the timer script. Hold on. Let me reopen it. There we go. When you move scripts, the thing just doesn't like it. So, timer script, it has this stuff as a string, right? Yeah in a string, so I think uh, let's make a public string return time and then return I don't want to do this. I think I just need to copy the update timer information, right? Right? Instead of timer.txt, we want to return. Or I guess what I can do is string time and then return time. Return time at the bottom. We'll do time equals zero. String time equals blank. Okay. Just a, oh, there must be a mismatch in parentheses somewhere. Okay. So rather than string time, we're just going to do time here. 
time. 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 And then we do not care about this thing to reset all of the numbers here. So that does not matter. We just want to run through and get the information. That's all. Okay. Then we'll at the end return, and it could potentially be a blank value if for some reason it decides not to get any of that for some reason. Okay. Also, I should... I should make these public. That way I can reset the timer uh, from other scripts. I just gotta grab hold and do like timer dot reset, essentially. Actually, you know what? Public void reset timer. And we'll just do a uh, Which means I can keep them private. And then I just have to call one thing instead of three things from other scripts. Keep it nice and tight. Right. Okay. That'll just reset the timer. And be perfect. Okay. So, over in our uh, event tracker, we have our New level time, which is going to be just that, whatever. Um, the thing is, with this stuff, you don't really know what you need until you actually need it. Just hilarious, right? So we're probably going to need a uh, list string level one top 10 equals new list of strings yeah so let's just say we're gonna start off with five Oops, hold on why did I not grab the colon from the end there the hell Two, three. So level one, level two, level three, level four, level five. Okay. So we're going to have, let's just say for now, we're going to have five different levels right now. And each one is going to have a top 10 leaderboard for the local top times, right? And each one of those strings is going to correspond to these strings here, whatever, right? So. In addition to that, we probably want a string called highest level. And then, I think we'll just go with that for right now. Okay. So, now that we have that, we can go back to our event script here. And we can go ahead and do et, et. And we can basically just copy this and then switch it for the event tracker. That way we have both of those learned and ready to go, right? Okay. So. First thing we want to do is we want to set ET. I guess we also want to grab timer. So timer script timer. And then we want to do I guess my GM can hold the timer too. There we go. 
or can it? Maybe I should do it level based. Probably attach to the level, right? Okay. So we'll do timer equals game object dot find game object with tag level dot get component timer script. There we go. Because if I set it to the uh, the GM, since timer, uh, if we look here, timer script, it requires the timer value, which actually it's part of the canvas, isn't it? Yeah. And the GM and the GUI should always be together. So, you know what? Never mind. It'll be part of GM. Timer script. Timer. There we go. All right. So we'll just go ahead and change this to GM instead of level. So fun fact, um, the things that are like these values here, for example, um, if I were to add another scene, which I don't think I can do from here. Um, anyway, if there was another scene like main menu, you know what, let's just make one for the heck of it. So create a new scene. Scene, we're gonna call this main menu. And if we had this here, as you can see, it has its own camera and stuff, whatever. Um, but let's say, for example, if, if GUI was down here, and then we can see scene mismatch, crossed scene reference not found. So you cannot reference across scenes, which means that the GM and GUI have to be in the same exact scene for it to work, right? Because you can like enable and turn off scenes and stuff like that. Right now, we're just going to unload the main menu scene because we don't care about it. But we'll use it later, but not right now. All right, back to this. So what we want to do is we want to save the current time. So we want to, first of all, grab uh, string time equals timer dot return time and that'll give us the current time that we have and then we can do actually i think we can just do et dot what was it again it was uh new level time right I said we'll do the protection level. Oh, because I didn't say it's public, right? Duh. I don't know why I was like, oh yeah, everything's going to be public just because it's a public class. Because I'm smart. Okay. Now, we should be able to have that just assigned directly into that. Excellent. Okay. So, that'll set up that. Which then, mm, the tough part's gonna be determining how we tell which one is where in terms of leaderboard. I guess we'll have to pull it apart, convert the string into an integer, test each individual thing. Yeah, that could be fine, I guess. Okay, um, let's do that real quick. So, um, private void check high scores. I'm not gonna, I don't know why I put an exclamation point there. Um, okay, so we want to grab check high scores here, check high scores, boop, boop, boop. Okay. <clears throat> so.
So, when we check the high scores, first we're going to need to grab, we're going to call this string, um, what should I call this? I guess I need to call it time again, equals et dot new level time. Already a string, right? Okay. We then need to do. We need to parse the string. I don't remember exactly how to do that, but I've done it before. So let's see. It was in my. Was it the quest tracker script? Yep, right here. Okay, so I think we need to. We need using the system, but I'll, I'll not add that until we actually do need it. So we want to do this essentially. So we want to do string s equals time dot split, and we want to split it at the colons. Because if we look at the timer script, it's going to have the, uh, the time as separated by colons, right? So, let's see, if ours is great, I just want to double check all this, because I might want to make it actually have zero, zero, colon, zero, zero, colon, zero, zero to start, right? So if ours is greater than or equal to one, do that. However, if it's not, time is going to equal zero, zero, or Zero, zero, colon. Plus. Hold on. Seconds is less than ten. Oh, that then. Otherwise, zero, zero, colon. Plus. Minutes. There we go. Okay. That'll be the hours, then we got the minutes, then we got the seconds. Hours, minutes, seconds. Hours, minutes, seconds. Right. Okay, so now we have everything as it should be. I don't care about the actual timer itself here. I need it for here. So what this is going to do, it is going to split the um, stuff into the chunks of numbers that are separated by the colon. So if it's like 0, 1, colon, 0, 3, colon, 12, for example, it's going to make a string of three or a string array that is three values long, which is 1, 3, and 12 is, is what will happen there. And what we want. So. I think I also, right, so I need int parse this. So let's go ahead and copy that. Boop. We'll just grab that real quick. This is gonna be a bit of a pain. So what we need to do is also go serialized field, game object, level number, or not that, uh, int level number because we need to make a switch level number case one great I need to real quick just add a boop right there okay so with this I can easily track the uh, event tracker here. I'm going to move quest tracker off the screen so it's just kind of out of the thumbnails here and then let's go ahead and grab the event tracker put it over here so I can memorize all this stuff. So <clears throat> this is going to be a little complicated but since everything is being stored as strings I mean, I guess I could 
convert them into integer values and make them all seconds. And then see which one is higher than, yeah. Okay. So, let's make an int seconds equals zero. Fair enough, not sign value, never use clear. All right, so, after we get them out of the stream, we wanna do seconds plus equals int parse of the first value of the array times, ah, uh, so this is hours. Hours to seconds would be times 60 times 60. That's 60 times 60 is 100 and, oh no, it's 360. Is that right? Hold on. How many seconds are in an hour? Probably the easiest thing to just Google real quick. How many seconds are in an hour? Okay, yeah, it's around 60. 3,600. So we will do in parse seconds times that to do that. And we'll do seconds plus equals in parse 1 times 60, and then seconds plus minus plus equals in parse 2. That's just going to be seconds, right? So I think that is what I want to do. Just a moment here. Boop, and boop. Bring this stuff back up. Okay. So what this will do is convert the string into seconds. So we can do easy maths. Why is this one? Unnecessary assignment value to seconds. What do you mean? Get out of here. All right. <clears throat> so now that we have the seconds converted, we'll be able to easily tell how many, or tell the high scores, right? So, we need to do, I'm just thinking about how to do the list here. We basically need to do the same thing with each thing here. Okay, so for each, um, string a, no, we can't do s again. So we'll do it sh for high score. For each string sh or hs in et dot, level one top 10, we want to, first of all, do string, can I do string s again? We would sh dot split that. What? S equals, there we go. We'll do S1 then. Lame. Hmm. Okay. So we'll do that, and then we just basically want to do. Um, let's make a new int called int hs seconds equals zero. And then I can just do hs seconds. And I can just copy all this nonsense. I just have to change the value here to make that work. And then we want to um, ah. 
I just want to do an int counter equals zero. Or, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So we'll go through here and we want to do at the end of each loop counter plus plus. Okay. Because the first time it goes through, it's going to be zero, which is place number one. Second time, it's going to be place number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yada, 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 yada. All the way up to 10. And look at that. So once that goes through, we want to take and see if seconds is less than hs seconds new high score yay and so what that will mean is we want to um, thinking about this so a new high score has been set. And wherever we're at, we need to go and just move everything down one. Essentially. I think a for loop would be the best. So let's let's try this logic. So first of all, we need to store the current value. So we'll go string. Um, I'll do a list. List, string, I can do that in here, it's fine. I'll need to do one of those. So, we want to go list, string, equals, um, et, dot, Level one, top ten. Oh, I didn't make a variable name <clears throat> right. Old HS. <coughs> Let's just call it old HS one just to make sure. Okay. So we saved the values of this into this value, right? So now we can actually manipulate the values and check what's going on. So for wherever we're at, we want to do et dot level one top 10 and then counter equals et dot actually we can just do time right there, because we already stored that value there. So that'll be the new time, right? At the current counter level, which will erase the previous score. Now I just need to figure out how to do the rest. Okay. The easiest way to do this might be to open up a notepad, right? Let's say you have 10 values, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, <clears throat> right? And just for the sake of it, I'm going to do this so that they're all lined up on the left side. Okay. So let's just say we're going to ignore the first couple of values. Let's say right here is where you get the new high score at, right? So you get it at level three. So we're replacing counter at level three, right? And because we did that, we then need to move three to four. So three, two, four. And then four needs to go to five. Five needs to go to six. So on until 9 goes to 10, and then 10 is deleted, right? Because we don't need that value in the array anymore, because it's, it's been beaten. 
So, looking at this, let's also do zero break, one break, two break, break, three break, four break, five break. Uh, six break, seven break, eight break, nine break. Okay, so that's just to keep in track. So the far left value right now, it's going to be the um, index range, right? So think of the, the far left number, it's going to be what the counter currently is, right? So at index two, we're adjusting the third place value, right? Okay. So keeping that in mind, we want to edit this and make it so that the array switches through all this. So let's move that over to the side. And again, the easiest way to do this is probably going to be a for loop. So for, uh, we'll do int i equals counter. Uh, while i is less than 10, no, less than 9, less than 10, less than 10, i plus plus. Okay. So essentially what this is going to do is going to loop through um, i, which is being set to the value of the counter, uh, and then every time i is less than 10, or while i is less than 10, it's going to do this. And at the end, it's going to go i++, plus plus, which adds 1 to i, right? So, what we'll want to do is take, let me think here. So right now, let's say we're at 3 here, right? So the counter is 3, or the counter is 2, right? So, we're adjusting number three. And so we want to take, or regardless, we're going to take et dot level one top 10 at i equals uh, the old hs1 at I think it's that. Let's double check this logic. So, right index two. So this is going to be no. This should be plus one, and that should just be index i, right? Right. Because this one will be here. Let's, let's bring this out. So. <clears throat> So our, our first one goes into three. It gets slotted in there, nice and easy. And then we want to change the next value, but if I do the plus one, at some point, the index is gonna be 10, which it cannot be. So I need to do counter plus so I need to do nine here. I need to do less than or equal than, or less than nine, right? There we go. Okay, that makes more sense now. All right, so. Currently on three, but this is gonna be four, which, blah. I keep saying three and four, but it, I'm not looking at the index. So the index is currently two here, right? <clears throat> two plus one is gonna be three. So it's going to want at index three, which is the fourth place, it's going to assign the old third place to here, which makes sense. Okay, perfect. This is exactly what we want to do. This is how you do it. Cool. I'm just going to save that real quick. Let's go ahead and do my score. Um,
I think after this I can just go break. If there was a new high score. As well, okay. So I'll move this down to here actually. So for each uh, old high score, we want to convert it to seconds. We then check if that old high score is score is lower. higher than the new score, new high score, so save the old list of top and scores, assign the new value to the score that was beaten. Okay, and then after assigning that value, we want to move the rest of the values down the leaderboard. All right, so that takes care of that. Finally, we break here, and when we break, that prevents the rest of this from happening so it doesn't keep overwriting scores all the way down, right? Okay. Perfect. I think that works. So that works for one. <laughs> now we just need to uh, basically make this a bunch more cases. And everything should work. Okay. So, case two. So will any of this cause issues if I just replace this stuff? It is not, okay, so I can just reuse these uh, numbers here, perfect. Love to see it. Cool, so I'll just do the first five levels. Case three, break. We want to do a level three, level three, level three, level three. Okay. And we want to do case four, break. Level four, level four, level four. Level four. Ah, uh, that sucks. Match that up. And then level five. So case five. Break. Level five. Level five. Level five. Level five. So that's what I'm going to have to do here. Um, problem is I'm gonna probably have like at least we're gonna at least do like a dozen levels if not I want to at least have like 50 levels at the end of this game um which means I'm gonna have to do this 50 times so 10 more times that length it's gonna be a lot a lot well the good news is I can just kind of Compress all of these so it doesn't get too long. It'll just be like this times 10, which uh, we're already at 200 lines. Probably gonna get up to 500 uh, just from all that. But anyway, that's that. So let's down here on five. We need to add 
more I score cases in finish level script equal to total number of levels. Smiley face. All right. That will do as we make levels. I don't want to make like 50 and then be like, oh, I only made 40 levels. Well, that's fun, right? So I should take care of all of that. And that was just one little thing of the finished level script. Oh boy. Uh, I'm going to grab a drink real quick. I'll be right back and we'll continue. Always good to get up and stretch every once in a while too. Okay. So now that we have the you know time that we cleared it saved and we've set a new high score, if we got a new high score, that is, next we need to load the next level, which <coughs> I guess we'll want to do a serialized field game object next level. And then I guess just instant, well, I guess we can do game object NL equals instantiate next level and then we can do nl.transform.position equals this dot <laughs> transform dot position. <coughs> no, that's not what we want to do. Because that would just be the end level position that's going to. We want to do game object dot find game object with tag level dot transform dot position. I don't think I need the uh, the event tracker right here. I'm going to move it off screen just in case I need to reference it again, which I don't think I will at the moment. That's fine. So we're going to do this so that the new level that we're going to be spawning spawns at the same position the old level was, because they all should be the same size. Right. That's all there is to that. And then we need to do... Ah, uh, this is going to be tricky. I suppose I can have the player spawn at the same point in every single level. Well, hold on. Let's copy this. We want to do game object old level equals. I'm just going to do this first. Because that stores the old level um, and whatnot. Because I think if I used that down here, it could have also gotten the current level that was just spawned in, which we don't want to have happen. We can go old level uh, transform dot position to do that a little bit cleaner. And then we can do hmm. if I do Game object dot find game object with tag player dot transform dot position equals 
old level dot get find hold on dot find uh, no ah uh. What if I do child? A component, children, children, children. I'm trying to figure out a way to get the spawn point. Could I do transform dot child or get, get get child with tag? Find, find, oh, hold on, find child, find child, which is string n. Which, if I name them all spawn point dot transform dot position. Instead, use what the fuck? What does it want me to do? It says instead use or use find instead find something system string what. M S C O R lib. Fucking weird. I'll just try this and see if it works. Okay. But we would need to actually have something to try it on. How it work? All right. Anyway, we're gonna ignore that. There might be a better way to do it. Um. In fact, hold on. I'm just gonna. Cut this dot child get child index. Okay. But I could just do get child at index. If I do like child five, for example, dot transform dot position. And if we look at my current level, we have child one or child zero. One, two, three. I guess we'll be child four. Change that to child four. And for example, had spawn point up here. That would then be child four of the level. So as long as I always put the spawn point below the collider tile map, it should. Spawn in the correct place. Right. So we'll do that. And then once the character is moved, all that I need to do. Let's, because I could in the, uh, once we actually have a new level created, I could just immediately delete this one and do gm dot is loading equals true, right? But sometimes it takes a moment to initialize the, uh, the map. I could do I enumerator to 
delete level. And then I can copy this down to here. Just wait a second, because that should be all it takes, right? And then we can do start coroutine delete level. Oops. Fine. And then we can do gm dot is load oops. is loading equals false, and then this dot destroy. Is it just destroy this? This is what we do. So basically, we're going to get and set the time, right? And then we're going to come into here, save our old level, generate the next level, place it in the world, all while we have like a loading scene up to hide everything that's going on. We will do... Then move the player, start this coroutine, which will give the new level some time to generate. And then finally set GM loading equals false and destroy the old level. destroyed this we're only destroying the uh, finish level script game object we're not destroying the actual old level so we need to in that coroutine we pass in the old level value we got from before and then destroy the entire old level Easy peasy, easy stuff. Okay. However, I think I will create a new script called level script. And we're going to attach the level script to the level, of course. Can't I move this spawn point? The snap was on, yeah. Yeah. Here. Anyway, turn that off for now. Okay. I'm not gonna put the spawn point over here. Whatever. move that here for right now. All right, so the level script, what we want to do is on awake, we want to get a serialized field. We want to call it uh, string level name. And then we want to also grab the event tracker. So et et on awake we grab the et equals game object uh, find game object with tag gm dot get component et and then we do et dot current level equals level name. That way we're keeping up on the level. Um, How do we keep track of the highest level, though? Maybe highest level is an integer. Okay. 
Then we also do serialize field string level number. Do I need to do that or can I just get rid of the redundant stuff? I guess I do need both. Okay. So, and then we want to check if et dot uh, highest level is less than level number hmm? what are you uh, what are you doing here <clears throat> hmm? didn't I save the change there oh because I made that a string for some stupid reason there we go there we go okay so if the highest level previously is less than the level number, <clears throat> we want to change it. So et.highestLevel equals level number. That way it saves the fact that we just um, got to this next highest level, essentially. Okay. I think... I also need to add a saving into here. Save game progress. I'm going to do that later, though. I'm going to make a note for myself here in my little handy-dandy <coughs> notepad. I had saving to the game in the finished level script line four. Because I don't want to save when the new level loads. I'm going to save before we change levels. That way. level script. So in here, all I really want to do is make it so that the, I guess, level number gets incremented, right? And change the level name. That way we uh, have a constant feed of what we're doing. So I think that's all I need to do for the level. So we can go ahead and get rid of that. And if we look here, now we have that stuff. So we can go a level one, uh, tutorial level, for example. We can just call the name of that, and that'll be that. So whenever it wakes up, it's going to send that stuff into the uh, event tracker. And if we uh, look at the event tracker, which I think we can here, so if we were to hit play and wait, we can see that the current level changed to tutorial level, highest level changed to one, since that is what the and stuff there is set up to do right so yeah we also probably want to in the level script we want to restart the timer obviously so we want to go um Be the GM, right? Yeah, GM. So, GM, GM. Copy this. Put that down there. Do that. Do that. Okay. So, GM. Dot. Get component children. Uh, wait. That's not what I want to do. I want the timer. Uh, 
gripped timer. There we go. That's what I want to do. So we want to do timer dot reset timer. We want to reset the timer. However, we also have to make sure that the timer is actually set active, which bit of a drag. Hold on. Right, that's the timer script there, and that one goes into that. Right. So I guess when we... Yeah, so when we go into timer script, and we reset the timer, we should also do timer.set uh, timer dot game object dot set active true and just in case it's the first level that way the first level uh, will load up it'll reset the timer and it'll set the timer to be active because if I press play now uh, the timer is off but it should show up right there perfect love to see it love to see it okay we can get rid of that. So that should be all we need to do with the level, uh, the, the level script now, I think. So we'll go ahead and close out of that. Save that for now, save that for now. I think I can get rid of the timer script. The pitfall script is completed. The lever script is completed. Pressure plate script. Hmm? Hold on. Wasn't there like a player thing here? Am I done? Am I, am I, am I like freaking out or like, was there supposed to be something here for the player and now there's not? It checks if is one object. We're spawning it in, but it works when I cross it, yeah? Right? Where's the pressure plate? There's one object. It worked when I crossed it, right? Yeah. But I'm not a enemy, right? Oh no, because it's object to manipulate. Right, I am I'm an idiot. It's fine. Pressure plate is finished. The rest of the stuff is still going to be done. Um, what was this error I got? Load screen of the GM has not been assigned. Right, because I haven't made a, a loading screen yet. Uh, actually, what we can do here real quick. Let's go to... Did I? No. Not. All right, let's real quick... We'll create a new panel. Okay. We get a solid background, but we're gonna make it black. Um, why is it like rounded at the edges? Hmm. What I could do is I can remove this background and I should do that, yeah? Okay. All right, so with that done, let's then add onto this panel. Let's do it loading panel so it has a name. I'm just gonna add a tag too. Just in case I have to find it from anywhere else ever, it'd be good to have. Loading panel, and then we want to 
add a little text mesh little guy here that says loading. We can just throw this guy down here, resize it, make it a bit bigger, make it like size 75. There we go. Very simple loading screen. Uh, nothing too fancy, we don't need anything fancy. So this we're going to hide, but in GM, we're going to toss that bad boy over to the loading screen there. And he's a peasy. Okay. Let's save real quick. Okay. Now I should take care of all these errors that say loading screen has not been assigned, loading screen has not been assigned. All right. That's dumb. So now that we have basically all of our uh, items here working and everything's good and beautiful, let's work on some of the user interface stuff here for the uh, settings and all that good jazz. But uh, first, I'm going to go to the bathroom, take some time to stretch your legs or whatnot, and we'll get right back to it in just a moment.
All right, I've returned. So, like I said, we're going to do some of the user interface stuff, namely the uh, quit main menu and the settings panels that we were going to have in the original. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so let's just bring this over so you can see. We're going to create the ingrained settings, yada, 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 yada menus. Easy as that. Okay. So, first of all, what we need to do is we want to open up our pause menu. Because everything that we're going to be making right now is part of the pause menu, right? <coughs> and I should probably also select the pause menu script because we're going to be editing that stuff as well. Okay. So, in the pause menu, let's create an empty object called other menus and create a new panel which we're going to call settings panel but I'm going to just copy the well let's first of all stretch it out a bit here shall we so I don't think we'll need very much room for settings. <coughs> it's probably just not going to be a uh, lot. I think the only thing we're going to really need is volume controls. Um, that'll be basically it. It's not like we're making a uh, 3D AAA game with like a bunch of sliders for low distance and stuff like that. There's not going to be any like quality difference that we're going to have to do as. So uh, let's see. Left is going to be negative 350. Right is going to be negative 350. Top will be... What was it before? Not negative. That's why. Uh, negative 300. Yeah, let's make it negative 250. There we go. And then bottom is going to be negative 250 as well. That should be good. And so let's go back to our... Uh, is it assets? Yeah, it's under GUI. There we go. So let's go ahead and we'll add <clears throat> our background here. And we want to make it nice and opaque so it obscures the previous one there. And we will then, before we add anything else, I want to copy this twice so I can do the confirm quit panel and the confirm menu panel. There we go. They're all going to be the same, use the same background more or less. These ones will be a little bit smaller. Um, I can probably just make these negative 200, negative 200. Negative 300. Actually, we can probably make it 200. These motherfuckers. Negative 200. Make them nice and square. Don't have to be anything too fancy for these. Okay. <clears throat> Excellent. So now that we have these, let's let's start with the easiest ones first, which is going to be the quit panel. Easy as that. So we want to add two buttons. One button being um, the confirm quit. And let's actually hide this panel and this panel real quick, just so we can focus on this one. All right. And then let's, of course, switch the buttons here. And the text color, so it shows up properly. Okay. Let's go ahead and widen the button out a bit. We'll name this one Confirm Quit. And then we'll name this one Return to Game. Return Button. Return to Game. 
So let's actually widen these out a little bit. There we go. And this one. There we go. They're not going to be exact. So. Pretty close, though. So the untrained eye will be able to discern, maybe. Okay. Let's make sure that these are the same height and stuff. So 125, negative 175. Negative 175. There we go. I just want to have them, you know, that. And then I can go negative 125 for that one. We'll attach that one to the bottom right. Attach this one to the bottom left. And then... We have our two buttons, perfect. We then need to add some text. Go ahead and center that. Go ahead and widen the box out here as well. And then do that, and we can just go bloop. Okay, now let's increase this to 45. Are you sure you wish to quit? All. Um, not all on save progress, because you're not going to save the game. Um, how do I want to word this? I got an idea. Let's make a couple of these text boxes. I can do this one in smaller text. We'll do 40, well, let's do 35 point text for this. Actually, let's make this one a little wider. So we can try and get. I was hoping it would go to like another like line or something, but nope. Two lines for that still. I was hoping it was like, are you are you sure you wish and then to quit there? But whatever, whatever doesn't matter. So <clears throat> what we want to type in here is progress in this level will be lost, but progress in previous levels has been saved. Let's go ahead and make this wider as well. Got it. How about 30 point pop point on also I, I hit there we go. How does that look? Be sure you wish to quit. Progress in this level will be lost, but progress in previous levels has been saved. I think that makes sense, right? I want to let people know that if they quit, the current progress in that level will be lost, but it's saved. All previous things up to that point, right? I think that makes sense. So. Now, we just need to set up what these buttons do. We want to do on click. We want to grab the pause menu and drag it down to here. And so on confirm quit, we want to do, I think it's just confirm quit, yeah. Yeah, confirm quit for that one. And then return button, we want to do no exit. There's no exit, if I remember correctly, is what we decided to do to close everything that was not the other stuff, right? Okay, so that one is done. Okay, let's just look how that looks in game. It's kind of hard to frame things from up you know, here, so that's how that would look in the game. Not bad. Okay. We can go ahead and close out that one. <clears throat> Next, the main menu panel. Okay. I think what I could do here is copy all of this, paste it into here, since they're the same size and everything. We have all this stuff in here. So... 
Instead of confirm quit, I want to name this confirm exit. And we want to change this thing to be confirm exit to main menu. And then the return button, same thing, same thing. We want to change the text of this button to say confirm exit, not quit. And we just want to change the text. Are you sure you want to return to the main menu? And we'll just move this one down a little bit. And have it like that. In fact, I could probably just say Return to main menu. Like that. And that should be this stuff finished. Okay. And it should look pretty much the same. Hey, Big Shark. Thanks for the follow. Welcome. All right. And that should take care of the confirm returning to the main menu. Now we got the settings, which a whole other beast, but it should be fairly simple enough. So let's go ahead and you know what? I'm just gonna oop, not that. We're just gonna copy the same buttons in. I will be changing what they do, but just for the sake of having the buttons here. Let's do close settings for this button. Or exit without saving. Let's go ahead and make the button a little bit taller. Get it nice and fit in here. Here we go. Okay. So this one, we want to change to be no exit. And in this one, we want to do apply settings. Because sometimes you just want to check the settings without applying them, you know? And so, pause menu, apply setting. And we'll rename the text here to apply and close settings. Okay. And then we want to readjust the size of this as well. Not that way. Keep going. There we go. Now there's a level. Excellent. We'll have those two buttons there. And then let's change the text. The main text will adjust to go up a little bit higher here. And let's give it a nice underline. Why not? I think. What about bold? Eh, that's fine. We'll do gold. Next, I'm going to get this text, but I think what we will do is the volume sliders, which is really all there is to do with settings here. Actually, you know what? I think the settings panel is going to be a little too wide. Go ahead and bring it in. Go with a negative 240 and negative 240. There we go. All right. So I'm just going to delete that one actually. Let's go ahead and create a UI object. And we're going to do a slider. And this is going to be our music volume. And let's adjust this. So the normal color. So that's a big little bar that we're going to be moving. Highlighted color. I don't know what that does exactly. We'll do that. Okay. So mix now. So we're just going to go 0 to 100. And perfect. Okay. Let's see.
Okay. Let's make this a little bit bigger. And make sure that it's centered. Put that there. And let's add onto this the text that says music volume. Now let's make this 30. Ah. Uh, 25? 25, maybe? Center it. Underline it. Do I want to underline it? Nah. Okay. We have music volume right here. And let's add that onto the... Oh, that's right underneath there. Never mind. Okay. Let's go ahead and copy this. And we'll just drag it down here. We'll rename this to sound effect volume. Or SFX volume, as I like to call it, because it's easier. So sound FX volume. Lighten this out a little bit. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Now we have our music and volume settings. Which is really all that this game is going to have. Okay. However, we want to do something on the value change. So, let's go ahead and grab both of these. Drag down the pause menu. And then let's do public void. Adjust music volume. And then public void adjust sound effect volume. Okay. So I'll hit save. And then we can grab these and adjust music volume and adjust sound effect volume. So, when the value gets changed, it's going to run that script and do whatever. Easy. Easy enough. Okay. <clears throat> Perfect. So, we need to do a couple other things, but other than that, it's good. So let's just double check we have these buttons all selected and they do things. Close settings. Perfect. Okay. Maybe I should rename that button to Exit Without Saving Settings. I think that's better than just Exit Without Saving, which might freak some people out and be like, uh, I actually want to save my settings and stuff though, <laughs> right? Okay, that's what we're going to do. Now, we have to do some other things. Okay, okay. First of all, we want to open the pause menu because we have to assign these values. So here is the settings menu. Here is the confirm quit menu and the confirm main menu menu. And over in GM, we need to do the same thing because we can also manipulate them. So, settings menu, confirm quit menu, and main menu menu. That's everything that's been set up there, perfect. I'm gonna keep this one open for right now. And, actually, hold on. Move that real quick. Let me just double check all these have stuff attached to it, perfect, okay. Perfect. So, keep that one open. Let's go back to our code and start coding some of this stuff. So let's start at the top. Uh, actually not, let's not do that. All right, so when you hit the quit button, which is to quit the game, we want to set, or we're gonna do a quit panel, right? Confirm, quit, 
menu dot set active true that's really all we want to do open menu to ask player if they really want to quit excellent okay now what we want to do is do the same thing for the main menu so we want to do confirm uh, main menu dot set active equals true okay and then for no exit we want to do basically the same thing for those confirm main menu dot set active false though and then confirm quit menu set active false and then settings menu dot set active false so that'll disable all those panels if they say no um, this one turns the panels active so open confirm quit to main menu panel is that so we can go ahead and just kind of close these ones because they've all been in handled bar and now we just got the settings and then we've got the confirm exit to main menu which uh gonna take some thinking i think we can do oh it shouldn't be too hard so i need to remember how i transition scenes let's open up my previous main menu script for my old game. So if we close out of this stuff, start audio, play audio, load game, load settings, All right, new game. So it was scene manager. So we need to load in this particular feature, which is using Unity scene management. That way we can do the scene manager dot load that. So, we want to do on confirm main menu exit. We want to do scene manager dot load scene main menu uh, comma load screen mode dot single. So that basically just loads a single scene and it will delete the current scene that we have open uh, without doing anything else. And I don't think we actually need to do anything else. Because if we're quitting the current level, we should have already unlocked it as we entered it. So I think that's fine. Excellent. So we'll just hit save. That'll quit to the main menu. Easy peasy. Uh, all we have to do for that, load up the main menu. Okay, cool. Uh, we should also set the cursor to true, I think. Yeah. So you want to set the cursor equal to true so they can actually use the main menu when that happens. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Okay. And then do I have right? That's there. Okay, perfect. That should be all I have to do for that. I need to adjust the volume, which I think I have in here as well. Yep, apply settings and all that. Okay. We want to go to our event tracker script, which is also gonna keep track of our volume levels. So we want to make public. Uh, I think it's a. Uh, int music volume equals zero. Actually, we're going to set it to 50 by default, I think. And we're going to do the same thing to the sound effect volume. So they're going to start at 50% regardless. They'll be changed as we save and load and stuff like that. But for now, that's what they're going to be. Okay. So. Wrong one. I wanted the pause menu script. Okay. So as we adjust the volume, we're going to be adjusting the music. However, I need to grab that as well. So 
Let's do serialized field um, audio source, not audio settings, audio source uh, music. I'll do another one for the sound effects. So SFX there. And real quick, I know I have a sound effect one, but I don't think I have a I'm gonna rename this to FSX up here. There we go. Alright, I'm gonna go ahead and copy this and make it my music source. And we'll rename this to oh well, I don't have music here, so we need to add one. We'll start this at 50 as well. I guess 0.5. All right, so that one plays on awake. This one we do not want to play on awake because that's just going to be sound effects. Um, easy. We should also click loop here, I think, because we want the music to loop uh, when we're doing stuff. Excellent. Okay. So back over to here. Those will be a sign if I be dragging them in, which I honestly should just do right now real quick before I forget. So we have the music source and we have the sound effect source. Easy peasy. Okay. So when we adjust the music volume, we're gonna want to save what it was previously which I guess should just be, yeah, it'll just be that, so that doesn't matter, Never mind. So when we adjust it, we want to change that volume. So we want to do music.volume equals, uh, do I have to, hold on. Gotta be in here somewhere, right? Update music volume. What's that? Hmm. Let me just double check this real quick. Right. So I need to add another thing here. Serialized field slider. Hold on, I need to go using Unity Engine.ui. There we go. So slider, music slider. I will do the same thing for the sound effect slider. There we go. Because we need to be able to reference the, the volume uh, value here, right? So it should be 50 to start with, right? Both of these, by default, anywhere from 0 to 100. All right. So now that that's been set, we can say we want the music.volume to equal the slider, or I guess music slider dot value. Um, however, if we look at the volume here, it's in a decimal, so I think we need to divide it by a hundred, which would make sense if we look at our adjust settings, or save settings right here. Okay, so we divide it by a hundred in order to get the decimal value that goes into it. Um, and then we can just copy this, nice and easy, over to here, and just rename this stuff to SFX, SFX, easy peasy. And we can just save. Okay, so, now, I do need to edit something here for the no exit, which is, 
If we quit out of the settings menu, we need to reset music.volume equal to et. Dot. Didn't I save the event tracker? I did not make the event tracker here. So et, et. Just copy this, paste that, et, et. Okay. Now we have the event tracker here. We can do event tracker dot music volume divided by 100. We also want to do the sound effects, so sound effects dot volume equals et dot volume divided by 100. Left. So that is in case they adjust the volume to whatever they want to do, and then they hit exit without saving, it will just undo what they changed. So like if they change something here, it's going to affect the, uh, the settings right away. So they can hear it and tell like what's going on. Although I guess the sound effect one, you won't be able to tell uh, anything happening. I guess I could add like a sound effect to it. So if I go up here to serialized field, audio clip, um, test sound, for example, I could adjust the volume and then do effects dot play one shot and then do the test sound for example um, so if I move the bar it's gonna make a sound and then play it once right the music volume it should keep playing as the uh, player is paused anyway so that shouldn't matter too much there okay I'm just looking at my code and comparing it. Like, why did I do get component audio so weird? Um, but that's fine. I guess that's because the GUI wouldn't be there. Yeah, that makes sense. Never mind. Ah, I'm just stupid. Okay. So we have that all set up. That's the volume adjustments done. So now we need to do apply settings. And this one. Fairly simple as well. We just need to do et dot music volume uh, equals, and we want to do music slider dot value like that. Uh, I think I can go like this. Just make that an integer. Cannot convert from float to what? Hold on. What's going to be a float value? Do I assign it here? Hmm. I have to do the divided by 100. Okay, that's fine. <clears throat> we'll do music slider divided by 100. Music slider value. Is that what I want? Hold on. Let me just double check. Music slider dot value would be this number, yeah. So fifty divided by a hundred. Okay. Divided by one hundred, and this is gonna say you can't convert float to it. So we'll just remake the save values floats, which should then be zero point five f. Zero point five f float. There we go. I'm so picky. So I forgot how to convert to integers, but that's fine. This is okay. This actually will probably come a little more handy than before. So sound effect slider, sound effect volume, and then since we already applied it when we changed it, we don't have to reapply it to the things. Okay. 
Cool. So that applies that, and then we also want to close the settings. So settings menu dot set active false. Now we just close it, and everything's good in the world. Okay. So now comes the fun part. We basically have to do the opposite of what we've been doing. So when we open up the settings menu, we want to set the um, value for the uh, the slider, right? We don't want it to be like set to zero by default, right? So if we look at our, uh, our thing here, right now it's correct, but if the player adjusts the volume to like 100 and then they close it after applying it and come back, it's going to stay at 50 because that's just where the graphic is at, right? So we need to change the value to be where we want it to be, right? Very simple. We just need to do the music slider dot value equals et dot music volume. Simple as that. Let's do SFX volume and SFX value. And that is all we have to do for that. In addition, however, also opening up the settings menu. So we need to do settings menu dot set active equals true. So that should work. Uh, let's go ahead and close the main menu script that we had there. I'm gonna remove that. And did I save? I did save. Okay. Alright, so now if we click on the pause menu, we have all this extra stuff. Um, like the music slider and all that good jazz. So we need to first of all hit the lock button up here. We do a lock. I want to add another tab called another inspector. I'm just going to throw that right here for now. We're going to select the music volume here so that I can grab this slider from the music volume and put it there. Same thing with the sound effect one, grab the slider, put it there. That way I don't have to search for the sound effect volume, music volume, sliders, uh, like with code. I can just click here, there you are, and we're done. Okay, so. <clears throat> And then go ahead and close this tab, unlock that tab, and we can go back to our pause menu. All right, so uh, why don't we find a sound effect real quick? Um, I'm going to add this, uh, this menu button sound effect that I have from my previous game. And we'll go ahead and just drag that over here to the test sound effect. And while we're at it, let's add us some music. Just for some background noise here. Just grab that one. Take a moment, okay. And so we can just drag this up to our audio clip. <clears throat> Excuse me and that'll just start playing automatically. So let's go ahead and close the settings panel and we'll close the pause menu. And I'm gonna turn off my music for a second. All right, so no more background music. So we should be able to hear the, uh, the game music now when we hit play. I'll be able to just barely hear it. You should be able to hear it. Okay, we can move around, hit escape, bring up the menu, and we can go to settings, and we can kind of see if we can adjust the music volume, works perfect. The sound effect. It's a little bit annoying. You can also just click for one, but that's fine. Oh, when it gets highlighted, uh, the red goes away. Good to know. Anyway, we can hit uh, X without saving. Go back here. It does decrease again, so that's good. Um, main menu pops open that. Uh, quit pops open that. And then resume should just close that. Excellent. Perfect. Everything in the menu works. Hallelujah. All right, so let's quit out of here. And then let's open up the pause menu one more time. 
we can change the settings panel real quick. We want to select the uh, sliders here. And the highlighted color, I think we also want it to be red. I think that's what the highlighted color was. So let's just see how that looks. Maybe it's the pressed color. The selected color? Yep, the selected color is what it was. Okay. That's perfect. Selected color. All right. I might as well just make all of them red. I don't think it matters. Okay, perfect. So that's all of that set up and working beautifully. Let's go ahead and close all these once again. Boom, boom, boom. All right. So if we look at our list of things to do here, we have all of our code in the pause menu script completed. All of the settings, the main menu, quit prompt, the quit game, quit prompt, all of it is done. Okay. And then we, of course, already dragged in the uh, game objects into the pause menu and the GM menu there. So that's good. There is one thing that I noticed, however, with the timer script. Let's open that up real quick. If the game is paused, the timer would keep going. Ooh, that's not great. So what we need to do is add a GM thing here. So GM gm and we add an awake for gm equals game object dot find game object with tag gm dot get component gm and now in the gm one what we want to do is we already have is paused that's perfect and now we want to do in update we want to do if gm dot is paused equals true only when oh I guess we want to do equals false not bad only when the game is not paused will the timer update all there is to that if the game is not paused or if the game is paused it should stop so. <clears throat> Let us take a look by hitting play, which should start the timer counting. One, two, hit pause, and it stops. Hit escape again, and it starts counting up again. Perfect. That's what we wanted. Okay. There's one other thing I have thought of. While we're loading, we probably want to do player allowed to move equals false. And then once again, player allowed to move equals true. Because that way, when it's loading, the player is not going to be able to move around um, and potentially break things. So that's what we want to do there. Excellent. Cool. So. What do we have left to do? So we made our event tracker script. I should actually start playing my music again. Here we go. A little background noise. All right. <clears throat> so the event tracker script has been created. We no longer need this one. We just have to add to it as we need things, which is simple enough to do. Levels, times, etc. Um, the slime enemy that follows you, we can wait, wait till later to that. Um, add the high scores later. Add saving into the game. Yep, okay. That's fine. So I guess, let's just make a main menu, shall we? 
Okay. So. Let's get rid of this for a moment. And we can go ahead and minimize this pause menu with all the spam there. And we can now go to this scene, load scene main menu. And let's go ahead and remove and unload the scene called testing space. So in our main menu, we are going to need to create a panel. No, not a panel, a canvas, which it already added for us, so that's nice of it. Excellent. I need the panel, actually. I guess you need a canvas. Okay. The canvas is going to be our, our lovely um, thing here. We're going to go 1080 or sorry, 1920. 1920, if I can type, 1920 by 1080. And we're going to. This is per unit reference, this is going to be 32. I don't think there's anything else that I want to change here for this stuff. Okay. Excellent. So, this is going to be our main menu. Uh, let's go ahead and. Actually, let's let's create another scene, real quick. Create scene. Uh, save save things. We'll just call it save things. Whatever. Go ahead and open up this again. And we're going to copy GM and GUI. We're going to cut them, paste them down here. Well, that's not what I want to do, but right there. So now we have the GM and the GUI. Uh, they're both going to be things that we're going to save and not delete as we move through scenes. So I will implement that code in just a second. But there are things that we needed because they have our uh, various canvases, and they have our music and sound sources. So those are very helpful to have. Okay. I don't think anything else matters here. We're gonna go ahead and just unload that scene. Perfect. Um, I will, however, before we get too far in and I forget, I'm going to add that code that saves the thing. Okay, perfect, here we go. This is all we have to do. So we just copy this over to our current GM on awake. I don't think GM currently has an awake, so that's perfect. Copy that in here. We want to do serialized field game object, the GUI right there. Easy peasy. And then that'll save the, uh, the stuff, essentially. Okay. Should I? Yeah. You know what? That makes sense. That makes sense. I was just thinking about the player. In my previous game, the player would persist through levels because they needed to have all of their stats beside them. But the player here is just something you control. It's not necessarily anything that matters. Let's go ahead and close our GM script here. Go out of here. Let's load this back up and look at our player. Here's our player. They just have some things. That's all. They aren't anything special. They're just saved here. Hold on, I'm gonna change this to three before I forget about it. Perfect. <clears throat> okay. So, what we're going to do is unload that. And let me check. Do I have. Level script. I need the level script again. 
Okay. Sometimes you just think of something that happens, and you're like, oh shoot, I need to fix that. So, serialized field, game object, player. Serialized field, game object, spawn point. We need to do game object p equals instantiate player. And then we need to move the player, so p dot transform dot position equals spawn point dot transform dot position. There. Perfect. That's what we have to do. Now the player, whenever the level uh, gets loaded, it is going to create the player. It's just going to create a new player, which means in our finished level script, rather than doing this nonsense to move the player, I don't have to worry about this potentially causing issues and whatnot. I can just get rid of this because since the level is creating the player, the player should become a child of a level. And when the player is a child of a level, that means when the level gets destroyed, the player will too. There we go. And I just thought that also when we load the level, we probably also want to maybe change the music. So I'll keep this open for later as we do that. But for now, we can set that aside. Okay, so here is our lovely main menu screen, right? Um, first of all, I guess what I could do, these are saved things. I don't need a camera here. Okay, so I'm gonna move the saved things higher up in the hierarchy. Whatever, it's fine. All right, so Canvas, I do want to make a panel because I want to be able to just do that and that and that to just give us a basic black background to work against right now. Actually, what I could do, hold the phones. Right there. I can use this lovely background that I have commissioned for the previous game. Good stuff. Okay, so next. Now that we got the background done, I can add a couple of buttons. Let's go ahead and add a image. We're going to call this the title logo. And for right now, I'm just going to bring in this little guy. Do I need to adjust the quality of? Okay. The title is going to change. I just wanted to have a placeholder for it so that we know where it's going to be. All right, so like right there. Boosh. Okay, so it's not going to be anything fancy right now. It's just going to be a default slime thing. And then I can add text or change this, whatever, just by dragging in whichever source image that I end up using for it, whether it's word art or whether it's actually me paying someone to make a title screen for the game or whatever. So that's that. Next, we can go ahead and add our buttons. So we're going to have a number of buttons. And we want to, of course, use our fanciful 
of this that we commissioned previously. How's it going, Sakashi? Welcome to the stream. All right, so let's change the font to 35. And let's go ahead and make these buttons a little bit bigger. There we go, and we'll do position zero. Make it nice and centered. Okay, so quick button should be at the bottom, as you know. Bam. All right, so quit, quit bottom there. What we'll do is we'll just go ahead and copy these. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Maybe enough. So next to quit, we will add the settings button. Next to that, just above it, let's see. Let's let's space these out first, and then I can determine if I have enough, or if there are too many. There are definitely too many. I'm going to delete that one at least. So we're going to need a button for new game, level select, and continue game. Actually, I think I have it written down here. Yeah. So we have the settings, quit, level select, new game, continue. Right. Okay. So quit settings. We're going to make this one be new game. Actually, maybe I have the top one be new game. This one will be level select. select and this one will be continue I keep I always hit enter at the end thinking that it's just gonna save it but it just does another line it's annoying okay continue and then new game and new game here new game okay and we can get rid of the last one there I think what I'll do is I will adjust these a little bit. I kind of want a little bit of space between quit and the rest of them, just so they're there, right? I'm just thinking how normal games are, right? So we have the, like, you hit the new game at the top. Obviously, that's going to be the only one that's visible at the time. Um, yeah, so let's do that. Now we just gotta make sure the spacing between them is good. So between quit and settings doesn't matter, but between settings and the other ones, it kinda does. So let's have settings at negative 250, a nice round number. Level select goes to negative 175, which would be a difference of 125? No. Just seven, no. Calculator. Difference is 75, yeah. So minus 75. This one should be 175 minus 1. So that should be negative 100. And this one should just be a negative 25. There we go. Now they're all properly spaced out. Lovely. Now we can select all the buttons, add on click. We're just going to copy this main menu canvas. I'm going to rename this actually. So main menu canvas, just so it's a little more easy to see for me. Okay. So now we actually have to add a script for the main menu. So it's going to be under managers, create script main menu script. Very simple. Okay. Wait for it to finish loading, adjusting everything. Like that. Okay. So, we're going to do a lot of things here. First, we need an awake. Then we need to get 
Uh, basically all the different things. So we need to do... Public void quit game. Public void uh, level select. Public void new game. Capital space. New game. Public void continue game. Public void settings. That should be all the buttons we need uh, for right now. Uh, we will need close buttons. So public void close. I'm just going to call it return to main menu. That's what we'll do. Okay. We will need a couple others for the level select specifically. But... That's different. I'll also have to think about how to actually implement the level select, because that's going to be a thing and a half for me to do. So, first of all, what we need serialized fields with game objects called the level select panel. We then need the settings panel. Simple. Um, the other ones don't need any panels. That's fine. Also for quit game, we can just do real quick application.quit. That's that one finished. Excellent. Uh, let's see. We want to do a serialized field for audio clip called menu music. And on awake, we want to... I wonder if I can do this now. If I do game object dot find game object with tag music dot get component audio source dot play menu music. Convert from what is you long? Audio source dot a play. What did that say? A play plus one overload. to uh, do dot audio wait, what? dot clip equals menu music and then we need to do this again there we go okay bit of a roundabout way but whatever so we just gotta find the audio source And we will play it. Easy peasy. We should also, actually before that, we want to do game object dot find game object with tag. Um gm dot get component et dot Music volume, right? And we need to do. That's a pain. Hold on. Hold on. Game object. 
music equals. I'm just going to do that. Or I guess audio source would be the thing. There we go, audio source there. So now I can just do music, not clip. I can just do music.play for the awake here. Good stuff. And then ET, ET. I'm gonna do this a little bit differently. ET equals that. Now we have the event tracker set up. So now I can do things like music.volume equals uh, et.musicvolume. Done. Well, I should put that before I hit play because I don't want the uh, music to be too loud before it happens, which it would be like a nanosecond, but I don't want to be like, ah! you know, kind of off, I think. Uh, okay. What else do we need to do in Awake? Well, first of all, we need to do a couple more things. So serialized field, game object, level select button, as well as the continue button. There you go. So, we want to do hmm. yes, so if et dot current level does not equal that, we want to have a continue button continue button dot set active is true. So basically, if there is a current level, which should be saved, um, the player, I guess, hold on, maybe not current level. Let's do next one. I'm just gonna copy this and do next one. That way, if I go to my finish level script, we have the new level, which I can then do et dot next level equals nl dot name. But wait, it's gonna spawn in with a name. Oh, I know. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. What? If we look here, the levels, I'll have a level script with a level name, which means we can just do nl.git component level script dot level name which might not be public right now. Oh, I already have the level script open. So we can just do public, public, like that. Which means we can then just take the level name and assign it in there perfectly. Then let's do the same thing for this next level. Do I need that? I don't think I need to right now. That's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll look how it fits. So, ET is going to save the current level and the next level. So, when we finish one level, it's going to point us in the next direction and say, the next level's name is this. And if we do not beat that level, the next level is not going to ever come up. Um, so, 
pt.nextLevel does not equal null. The continue button shows up because we have another level to beat. Um, so that's fine. Okay. We also need to check if... What do we want to use for this one? Highest level. So if et dot highest level is greater than one, we want to open up the level select button so that the user can use it. So show buttons if the player deserves them. That's how I'm going to word that. Right. So by default, the continue and level select buttons will be hidden, essentially. And what will unlock them is if the player has pressed the new game button, essentially, the next level text will actually have text in it, which means it won't be blank like it is right now, which means they will go to that level when they hit the continue button. It's fine. Then, for the highest level, if the level's higher than one, meaning they beat the first level, because if it's level one, you're just gonna hit continue, not level select. If they completed at least one level, which means they're on level two and they beat level one, they'll be able to open up level select and choose from level one or two instead of hitting continue. So that's the way that's gonna go. Anything else I need to do on awake? Let's look at the main menu. Nope, shouldn't be, okay. Perfect. So that's everything we should have to do on Awake. There might be some other issues that are gonna come up depending upon the load order for things. Like if here, for example, if the um, event tracker or the music, or the menu music does not load up before the Awake thing happens here, we might be in trouble. So we'll just see what happens. Maybe I'll add uh, music uh, another music thing just to the main menu itself or something. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. That's for another time, though. Okay. So. I'm going to cross off quit from my to-do list here. Just removed it. And now we'll go ahead and think of what we're doing now. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. Hmm. New game is obviously gonna start us in a game, right? So what I should do is make a new scene called Game World, I think, just real quick. So create, because if I don't create one and I say, hey, go to this place, so game world. Like if I say, like, load game world scene, and there's not a game world scene, then it's going to be like, that's an error, whatever. So the game world will have our level and everything. That's going to be where we're actually playing. The testing world is just where I'm testing things out. Okay. That's simple. OK. so. New game, we need to first of all do using unity engine.scene management. That way we can navigate through scenes. We want to, when we hit new game, we just want to do. Honestly, I've already forgotten how it worked. Uh, don't use this too often, so I'm just going to copy it here. <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and copy that there. We're going to make the cursor set to false, because we don't need the cursor when we're actually playing the game, unless we're paused. That's fine. So we're going to load up what we call the game world scene. Make sure it's spelled correctly, or else you won't get into it. That's how I spelled it, right? Yeah, OK. Excellent. So we have game world. We're loading in. 
that is all we have to do, I think. Is it? Hmm. Yeah. That's all we'll do for now. But we should do GM dot. Ah, I don't have to do that. Okay, whatever. Fine. I'm probably going to need this later for something else anyway. So GM, GM. Let me just get this going. Okay. Now the game manager is here. So we need to do GM dot is loading equals true. And you know what? I'm actually going to do a coroutine here, I think. So start for IE numerator start new game copy that down there so that way we give the, the GM some time to actually load through the thing there we go and we're not going to do this one for very long we're just going to do 0 0.5 seconds is how long we're going to wait to uh go in here so we're going to do start coroutine start new game that's that so what this will do essentially is it's going to set it is loading the true so that it can load through this and load into this and get the next scene loaded the question is do i want to do is loading false here i don't think i do i think i want to do another script which we're going to come over here. Let's open up the game world. Uh, I will leave main camera. I'm actually going to copy this main camera, delete that one, paste that here. That way I don't have to change the settings all the damn time. All right. There we go. Excellent. So our main camera is all set up and ready to go. We're gonna create an empty object here, and we're just gonna name this thing Game World. Uh, manager, screw it. Game World Manager. I'm not sure I'll do much with this. the The main thing I want to use this for is the awake. So we're going to make another new script, another manager called Game World Manager. I'm just going to call it that so it fits with the theme. Wait for it. Okay. I'm going to add it here to Game Manager. I'm going to put it at zero, 00. Something weird happens. <clears throat> okay. So, I don't care about any of this. What does matter is an awake script. And we're also going to need the event tracker and the GM. I'm going to go up here. Copy this so I don't have to type all that again. Okay. So what I need this to do is when it wakes up, it's going to load the level. So let's see here. If I look at ET, If et.highestLevel equals zero, 
we want to load in the first level of the game. Else, if it does not, we want to load in the level that we want to select, I guess. I don't know. Okay. Because there's going to be three scenarios for going to the game world. Right? Either we're going to hit the first new game button and do this, or we're going to hit continue or level select. Continue would be easy. one word I, I never remember or it's else if that's what it is okay so we want to NGM add another public boolean and we want it to start off as false in fact I should probably instantiate all of these that's how all those should start off as uh, if you just hit play on the game icon and whatnot. So we want to do if gm dot is continuing equals true. I'll load in the level that is to be continued. Otherwise, else. Basically, if this happens, we want to load in the level of the player selected, which also in GM, I think it would be good to have a public bool or public int selected level equals, we're going to set it equal to one, just for the sake of things. Okay. So, this is where it gets questionable about how I want to do this. Let's take a moment. I'm going to go to the bathroom, think things over, and we'll come back.
Okay, so let me explain what exactly I'm thinking about. For those of you who have played my previous game, I'm Just a Slime, it's on Steam, it's like five bucks, check it out. Um, the thing that you might notice when you double click the game icon or you hit play wherever um, to launch the game initially, it takes a couple of seconds, maybe four or something, or maybe five, depends upon your, your computer, I suppose. It takes some time to actually start the game up. And it looks like nothing's happening at first. The reason for this is if we go back to this with the, uh, the saved things. So in my I'm just a slime game, I have these things <coughs> essentially still existing when you launch the game. So in addition to like a main menu a screen that comes up, there's also the saved things that load up, right? So it has all this stuff, information in it, whatever. The main problem that I was running into with I'm Just a Slime is the way I move between levels is I have to store the levels somewhere so they can be loaded and um, you know, brought up and whatnot and referenced to be loaded in. So my thing was, in the GM script, I had a list of the levels. Um, well, not necessarily what it was in the GM. It was like a level loader script that had like all, I think like 13 or so levels. I forget how many I had. And that was causing the game to take forever to load. So at first I just had it uh, load in after you hit the play button. Um, and that was a bad idea. Because as soon as you hit new game or continue or load, it looked like nothing was happening for like four seconds. So you were like, is this, is this working? Do I have to double keep clicking the button? And that was causing some issues with like double loading things or triple or quadruple loading things. Because every time you click the button, it would try to load the game and load all the map data. So I decided, hey, why don't I just load all the information when you load the game first time before you even see the main menu. That way it's just, oh, I just, I have to wait for the game to load a little bit. It's a little slow at the beginning, right? That's what I did before. And those were huge levels with like a lot of data and information in them. They had a lot of different characters and dialogue and all that. And that's why it took so long to load. So my question right now is, do I, in the game world manager, have all of the information all the map data, all the different levels that I'm going to be making in here? Or do I put them somewhere under GM to keep track of that when it just first loads? That way all the burden is put on the first load time and the rest of your gameplay is buttery smooth for the most part, right? That is the question. Because these levels I'm going to be making, they're really small, like, compared to the previous game. Like, the 50 levels that I ideally want to make, at minimum, would probably be the total size in terms of, like, resource usage as one to two of my maps in I'm Just a Slime. So... That's really the question, is what I want to do here. Hmm. There's really all it's going to be is just a script that has an array of the uh, the maps in it or the levels. I think what am I going to be using it? Like what's going to be calling it? The 
next level script, right? And instantiate the next level. Oh, right, I was thinking I would just put the level. Right, right, I'm so stupid. I was just gonna, in the final level script, put the level that was gonna be loaded next, so I only have one loaded at a time. That's smart. Got all that thinking for nothing. The question is, how do I load the first map then? Because that's gonna be tricky. I guess in the game world manager, I would just need a list of all the maps that uh, are contained in it. So this is what gonna work. We're gonna have to do that. So list of game objects. Uh, levels equals new game object I was actually no serialize this do I even need the the back end of that I don't think I do it's serialized so all the levels are gonna go into here wham bam thank you ma'am and so they are gonna be added in the order that they are right so for the first level i can just do um how do i want to do this though instantiate levels zero the question though is is it going to be set to zero zero in the coordinate let's look down here that's, that's going to be zero, zero, right? There's so many, like, cameras right here. Change that to six. Okay, that's better. Ugh. Okay. So I think if I add the level... Assuming it's set to zero, zero, it should be fine. We'll see how it works when it actually blows up, right? We're gonna instantiate the level. If we're continuing, we want to do instantiate levels, and then It would be et dot highest level minus one, I think. Because if if you are on level one, it's going to change the highest level to equal one. But in the array index, it's going to be level zero, so it should be negative one. Right. Okay. So, DM select a level. Okay. So, for this one, we'll just instantiate levels at GM dot selected level. We call that good. Because once I add all the, the level select, what I'm going to do for the level select screen is have like a, uh, a list of levels with buttons. And you're gonna click the button you want to select and the button is going to send a signal over to here to change this value to whatever button you pressed if it's one two three four five six yada yada whatever right and that's how it's gonna go i think that's all i need to do for the game manager or the game world manager that is Okay. And that'll work. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna throw that all the way down here. Do I need player move anymore? I don't think I do. I'll keep it open just in case though. Okay, so <clears throat> looking back to this. Um new game. Start co-routine. It's gonna load up the game world. Uh the game world manager 
does this when it gets awake. So that's all that really matters. Okay. Actually, I think I can just do start game for this and use this for every single one of these. Level select is going to be a, its own beast. Um, continue game. We'll want to do this stuff as well. This is just a button that's going to start the game loading. And we're also going to want this. Also, I forgot down here. Once we're awake, probably want to add a code routine, i.e. numerator. Uh, game loaded. Ah, light. I have to copy this. We're going to wait a second. Ah, screw it. 0 0.5 for now. It's fine. And then gm.is loading is going to equal false. Thanks, NVIDIA drivers. Okay, and then at the end of all this, we want to do start code team, game loaded, like that. So once this loads up, it's going to set GM to false, which will allow the player to move once again and get rid of the loading screen as well. Okay, so let's double check this. So when you hit continue game, it looks for the highest level. But we want to do gm dot is continuing equals true for that. I should reset that here. So gm dot is continuing equals false. That way, if you go back to the main menu, it will automatically set that trigger back to false. So if you go back to the main menu and you go back to level select, for example, um, and you, if I didn't have that awake, is continuing set to false, it would always keep hitting this instead of going down to the level select one, because that would still be true. So that works. So we got continue. Okay, so new game, I think works. Continuing should be working. Uh, okay. And like I said, level select is gonna be a, a bit of a pain. So we'll deal with that in a moment. Let's do the settings first. So just like on settings, when you open the settings, I want to copy this information. It would just be easier to do. Let's rename this from settings menu to settings panel. Let's add in a using unity.ui but I can do serialized field, slider, <clears throat> music, slider. Why is that not working? Oh, it's unityengine.ui. That would explain it. Okay. So when we hit settings, we want to set those values and open up the settings panel. The return to main menu button is going to do settings panel dot set active false. And what other panels did I have? Level select panel dot set active false. That should be all I really have to do here. Okay.
Okay. So let's go ahead and design the settings panel. So before I, I forget and get too far, what? All right, main menu script needs to be added there. Excellent. Just hit save quick. The level select button, the continue button. All right, excellent. Now, <clears throat> I can go ahead and go here to game menu dot click game settings game menu settings level select main menu and level select i'll just do all this so i don't forget to do it later and be like why are my buttons not working uh, continue game and a new game new game all right perfect so all that has been selected and it's good so, we want to create a new panel called the settings panel. And let's go ahead and why not just, uh, let's not do that, I guess. <clears throat> let's go ahead and edit this first. We're not going to have it be opaque. Or see through, I guess. Right, so with that done, I'm gonna copy paste this, and this is going to be the level select panel. Okay. I might as well just drag those in here. Boop and boop. Main menu music. Um, might as well just slam that in there for now. We'll change that later, but that's how it's gonna be now. Okay, level select panel, you're going to go bye-bye for now. Settings panel. So this is going to be a little bit bigger than the other one. But I do think I can grab some of the stuff that's been here before. So other menus, loading panel. Let's grab these and paste them here. That way I don't have to remake these again, right? They're already there and ready to go. The rest of the stuff doesn't matter. We'll just hide that. Okay. I do kind of want to scale all this up, though. Go. We just need to make the uh, text bigger now as well. Let's switch to 35. How's that sound? Looks okay from a visual standpoint, I think. 35. And we need to adjust these and move it up a bit. Wait, did I move the wrong thing here? Hold on. That was right. Do that. Also, was the music one centered? It is not, just barely. That was like an E to the whatever power are. Okay. Then one of these. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's also go ahead and create just a lovely title for us here. Let's go, I don't know, 75%, 70 size font, whatever. centered, raise to the top, Oop, okay, so let's go ahead and move these sliders, right here is fine I guess, and then also we want to get those sliders there, 
let's go ahead and add another inspector. Toss it there for now. Grab that. This is the sound effect volume. Swoop. And the music volume. Swoop. Okay. Go ahead and close that tab. Okay. <clears throat> Next, we need buttons. UI. Button. Close. Back to the GUI and add our fancy thing there. Go to here and change the font. Let's make this like 40 size. And let's change this to close. And then let's resize this to make it nice and big and obvious. And we'll go ahead and put it down here. And then we'll copy this. Paste it. We're going to change this to apply. We can apply the settings, of course. Okay. Um, let's also, in the menu script, we want to get a test sound. I just did that off screen because I didn't feel like bringing it back and forth. So we'll add the text sound there for the menu button. Boop. Okay. Now. Now, 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 now. Now, 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 now. Let's see. Buttons. Okay. Let's set both of these to negative 400 rather than 401. I like even numbers. Space in between them doesn't matter because those are going to be the only two buttons. And then... I'm going to bring in this F button. Alright, I have to add an image. right into there. Um, hmm. Okay, we can do that. Let's add a UI Text Mesh Pro called Interact Key. Let's go ahead and adjust this so it's a little bit wider. Up and down too, there we go. Make that centered in the middle. Not that, darn it. I want to hit that one. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Change size to 1350, I guess. We'll do that. So we have kind of controls. Let's then add a uh, another X Mesh Pro here called Controls. Center it, underline it, and let's make that 55 size font. We're going to move that and just put it kind of over here. Okay. So, really the only thing that the player is going to do is move and interact and hit escape. So that's the only thing they're really going to do. So let's go ahead and add down my WASD keys as well. means we're going to need more images, so... Oh, 
I'm gonna just detach that for right now. Movement. And I'm gonna just copy. Move this one over a little bit here. Drop this down. So let's not do this. Copy that one. Mm -hmm. Make it a nice little WASD here. Okay, so let's see. That one is at negative 675. Negative 650. Negative 550, I'm sorry. Mm. How big is the gap between those two? Negative 115, so that's 115 difference in pixels, right? So between that and that, 100, negative 15, would it just be 15? No. What? Hold up. Oh, I went to the wrong one, my bad. First of all, let's switch these to be negative 100, so that they're nice and squared. So, this was, what was it again? 115? So that would be, going from that one, it'd be 560, yeah? Okay, and then going from this one to that one would mean we would need to go to 700 and... 90, right? And I can grab this thing and I'm just gonna put it here, grab these three and put them here. And I can grab the movement and put it more like that. Let's do 360 for that and then I can change this one to There, so they're more or less even, I guess. Okay, now we've got to change these. So this one's going to be W. This one's going to be D. This one's going to be... Wait, no, that's S, I'm sorry. That one's going to be D. This one's going to be S. This one's going to be A. Hmm. Honestly, I should move the uh, F key so it kind of lines up there. Otherwise, it annoys me. Okay. And then, one more. Pause slash menu. Okay, so I need to actually make an escape key. So real quick, let's just bring this guy down to here. Okay, first of all, let's go ahead and take this color and we are gonna go ahead and just fill that in after I delete that, so I don't have those weird pixels there. It's all a background, perfect. We're gonna add a layer. Mm. Mm. There we go. Okay, we're gonna grab the text. Oh, what font was that I was using before though? Darn, whatever. I'm gonna select white uh, for our font color. Um, how, how do I... Ah, there we go. Okay, so let's try finding a really good font that's like, maybe this one. That could work. Uh, so we need to change the font to a different size. It's a little bit more readable. 
36. I think 36 would be off, yeah. So, 28. Looks like it's going to be the one. So we'll go ahead and hit style, save as, escape. We're going to have to make that go to PNG. Save. Save. Flatten. Okay. Now I can go ahead and add the escape key over to here. Change it as well. Uh, bleh, there. 32, and apply. Now we just select this last thing. That, and we're gonna rename these real quick. Escape. SD. Just so they're a little bit better there. Um. I'm going to create an empty as well, so... Controls! I think all of that stuff's the controls, so we'll just put all that in there. So I can minimize the controls. I don't have to deal with uh, extra stuff like that. Okay, cool. So we have all that stuff. I'm not going to let people change the keys because I tried looking at that for my previous game and that was kind of a mess. So we're just going to show them the controls and let them change the volume and stuff. Easy as that. So that's really all I have to do here. Um, we do want to add buttons to these, though. Um, we need to do public apply. Oh, void, sorry. Public void apply settings. And then, yeah, okay. So for close, we're just going to go to main menu and return to main menu. For apply, main menu script. Did I save? I did not save. I'm smart. Main menu, and then apply settings. Easy enough, deep way, right? Okay. Honestly, I don't know. Having this—they just seem so small. fine though. We have that set up now. It looks a little bit better. Um, in fact, I might just move these down a little. Copy this text. Move it over here. To do that. And then I'll make a settings panel. Create empty volume that in there, grab that and that, oops, grab those two, move them down to volumes, there we go, okay, cool. So now I have that stuff looking fancy. There's one thing I have to do though for the sliders, which is move that over to here. And we need to also add a public void change sound effects and a public void change music. Okay, so let's just say it save there. Alright, so now sound effect volume. When you change a thing. We're going to do change sound effects, and for the music volume, over here, main menu, and change music. <clears throat> cool. 
Might as well save. Yay. Okay. Still, I can minimize that. Minimize that. Minimize that. Double check these have buttons on them. Yep, okay. Settings panel is complete. At least for visuals, anyway. Okay, so going back over here. Just like what we did with the pause manager. I'm going to throw that to the side here so we have it. When we open the settings, we, of course, went ahead and already set up the thing to change those values. Uh, but return to main menu, we need to change the uh, audio. Oh. oh. <clears throat> right, I need to do that as well. Alright, so audio source. Music. for the following. Welcome to the stream. Okay. So, now that we have those added in here, we don't have to worry too much about that other stuff. How's it going? And now back down to here to the return to main menu. We basically want to change the slider value. Or not the slider value. We want to go uh, music dot volume equals ET music volume and then sound effect volume equals so that just kind of resets the previous value that we had and then apply settings what that's going to do is go ET dot music volume equals music slider dot value and then ET dot sound effect same thing that we already did once And that will go ahead and apply the change that has been made so that when you return to the main menu, it does not undo the change. Um, then for just the many little changes to the sound effects, we want to do sound effect.volume equals sound effect slider dot value divided by 100. Which I also need to do here. Excellent. Excellent. Excellent, actually. Then we're going to copy this to change music and just change these values so they say music instead of sound effect. If I can spell music. Oh my god. Excellent. So basically, just the same thing we did in the pause manager, but with the main menu this time. So easy peasy, lemony squeezy. And then when we hit apply, we don't necessarily want to close out of the uh, settings menu, so we're not going to do anything there. We're just going to actually apply the change. Simple as that. Okay, so I think that's all I need to do for these. Okay. Go ahead and throw this back to where it was. <clears throat> okay. Now, let's go ahead and hide the settings panel, and let's unload the game world. If I hit save, I can also unload the testing screen. Let's just hit play and see what happens. Okay, I got an error. So what was this? Main menu, object reference not an instance of an object. And that is trying to call the music source, right? Okay. Yeah, I figured. So what I should do, we'll do a coroutine. I enumerator of wait to awake. 
this is such a stupid way to do this, but I have to like wait a couple of seconds before we do any of this stuff or else it's not going to be able to do this and it's going to give an error. So let's try that. We'll try 0 0.5 seconds and see how it works. Hit play again, see if we have the same error. Okay. Hit settings. Oh. Did I, uh... So, I was curious, it's telling me that line 87 here, which is this line, is not found. But it should be found because in the main menu canvas here we have the music slider. So is it the event tracker <coughs> that's not being found? Oh, I didn't call the code routine. Makes sense. Now it should work. No errors? No settings? Line goes up and down as we move it. Oh, I didn't put a sound effect in there. Right, I didn't have it. Do that real quick. I can change it while it's running. So sound effect. We want to do sound effect dot play one shot test sound. Save that. And we can post that aside. And works now. We can hit apply, do apply our changes, we can close, if we reopen, they're going to be down there now. Why? I think I know why, actually. All right. That is what would happen. Hold on. So when we load settings, we're doing that. We need to do times 100 up here. Otherwise, it's going to stay at 0 0.5 or whatever it was, which means we probably also need to do that up here. In order to make that work for that one. Okay, so now, <laughs> now if we hit play, Settings. Apply. Close. Settings. Okay. Drag them a little bit lower. Now it works. Perfect. Um. I'm curious though. We hit that. And I tried again. Why is it going? It started all the way up at top before, right? Why? Shouldn't be doing that. Because when I'm clicking settings, it's taking the... Hold on. No. Why? Why is it not doing it? So it just doesn't work on the first time? Hold on. What does awake do? I think I know it. Hold on. Um, 
right, the volume starts at 1 for some reason, so 0 0.5, there we go. And this music volume is 0 0.5, okay? And then in GM, I was about 50. Right, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, yeah. okay. So those were started at 50, which times 100 is 500, which goes off the scale, which is why that was happening. A little thing sometimes. So now if I do it, it'll work just fine. Yep, perfect. Hell yeah. Okay. So that is the settings menu completed. Excellent. Now we just need to do the level select. Let me grab my little note thing over here. Settings is done. Level select, new game, and continue buttons. Well, new game and continue are done. Okay, let's just do main menu. Level select button needs functionality and then main menu script line 59 just like so keep track of where exactly we're working here so we'll do that make a level select panel for main menu Needs buttons and such added. Okay, let's do that. So let's change these to one, two, three, four, and five for the sake of things. Okay, so I think I'll end things here for today. My throat's getting a little raspy and uh, getting hard to talk. So, to kind of summarize the things we did today, we did a whole lot, a lot of good progress. If we uh, move our script over here, we can open up our testing sphere. So let's also, I guess we'll start with the main menu. So with the main menu, we managed to get it all laid out. We got the settings completed. We added the buttons, the main menu, the continue and the quit button all work. Level select is not, but that's, we can't even test that unless we get levels going anyway. So that's fine and dandy. So with that, we can unload that scene. In this little thing here, our saved things, we added our GUI and our GM over here, so that way whenever we hit play, they always start up, and they're always <coughs> going to be loaded, regardless of what scene we're in, so that's really great. Um, in the game world, we made this script, which is going to hold all of our levels, and it's going to decide which level we're going to um, whenever we load the game into it, right? And then in our testing space, we can zoom into here, our lovely little game world. We not only figured some other stuff out, we, we imported our new blocks, our <coughs> immobile block that cannot be moved. Let's actually just hit play right here. Screw it. Our little block that cannot be moved no matter how hard we touch it. We have our lovely little cube that does move that if we push up into our pit hole will create a way for us to walk over the pit. We have our lovely pressure plate which if we go over here and like that we can see that we have the ability to spawn in new blocks if they get destroyed or <coughs> what have you. We can also, if we select the pressure plate and turn this little thing off, we can open and close that gate if we're standing on it or if we push a block onto it. Similarly, the lever, if we flip it, can open and close that gate as well. Very nice. And uh, we actually have some functionality over here that we can't really test because if I touch that, it's going to freak out, which let's do it anyway. See, we're going to have an error that says there's nothing here, because if we open that up, bring it over here, it's going to say GM, wait, what? 
Why did it do that? Hold on. This is object reference, not object order. Okay. Yep. I see. I need to, uh, I think what would fix this? Build settings. Hold on, let's, let's close out here for a second. Okay, so, build settings. Add open scenes. Um, save things needs to be priority one. Main menu is priority two. Game world is priority three. And we're just going to uncheck testing scene because we're not going to build a game with that one in it. So let's just do that for now. Do that. Okay. So now, if I hit play, do we still get the same errors? We do. Unfortunate. I was thinking that the, the build settings would dictate this one loads first, then that one, and that one, and that one, but... You know, on Anyway. What we need to do here is the same thing we did in the main menu script, which uh, we do a wait to awake over in our, where is it again? Sorry. Lost it there. So we do wait to awake. We do an I enumerator. Wait to awake. Fortunate that I have to do this every single freaking time. So we'll just do that and then wait to awake. We'll wait like. Right there. Yeah, that's where I want that. Do that because that's fine with that one because the finished level script, you're never going to be touching it within five seconds anyway. So it is okay. In addition to that one though, there was another error that came up. Was that the same thing or was that a different one? test that. Let's just clear out some errors right at the end. Um, but yeah, this is essentially all we've done today is add a couple of components, do some other stuff. Okay, so the level script also not having fun. So let's just do the same thing here again as well. Um, oops, not that. I e numerator wait to wait. Slap that in there. Grab these. Slap those in there. And then do start coroutine. Wait to awake. Easy peasy. Ah, OK. Undo that. Now if we hit play, we should no longer see the errors. Look at that. Now if I. The variable level script, stop and assign. What? What? Give me an error at the variable player of level script. All right. I'm an idiot. Hold on. So in the level script, I added a new variable called player and spawn point, for that matter. Um, spawn point should go here. And then player is a prefab. So let's go ahead and grab that and just throw that into there. And I can just delete my slime character now and we'll hit save. And now hit play, and now everything will work fine. He says, for like the third time here, here we have the player. When time has started, we can go ahead and go do stuff. We'll flip this lever. Uh oh. Why can't I clip through that now? I don't like that. Why? Why am I able to clip through it now? Can I clip through all the stuff? Like the walls? At least that works. However, the uh, error is that we don't have a next level selected, so... Why? Why can I move through things now? Wait, I think I know. I think I'm an idiot. Yeah. Okay. We figured this out 
a while ago. It's because Kinigmatic uh, does not let you interact with things. So that was the issue um, that we had solved previously, but my prefab did not have. So we have to get rid of that first of all. That, set gravity scale to zero because we don't want gravity to happen. Um, that one is still dynamic, perfect. Okay. So now if I load in, everything should work, right? He says again. Okay. Yay. Cool. Everything works once again. Excellent. Yeah. Helps if you, if you do not edit the prefabs outside of the prefab area, right? Okay. Cool. So that's done. Um, the only thing I would say I want to do is instead of waiting so long, maybe wait like 0.1 F, for example. Um, because you did kind of see how the levels showed up, and then I just kind of stood there without <coughs> a character to control. So I think if I just make all that stuff, like take a second to load, we'll see how this works now. A little bit faster, but I hate this error. It does not mean anything. I don't know why it shows up, but I hate it. Yeah, it's gonna happen a little bit faster. Um, that's just gonna have to be how it is for right now. We can tweak it later, but that's it. Anyway, um, this is once again our list of things we're gonna be working on. Next time, I think we'll do the level select, uh, <clears throat> at least partially. It's gonna be a little bit complicated because I want to add pictures to it to represent this is this level. Like level one looks like this. So they have an idea. <coughs> but I think that'll come later because um, I'll have to make the levels and then add those pictures that I take of the levels there. So it's going to be a thing. You got to hear my voice going already. Goddamn. But uh, anyway, so what we'll probably do is finish that or at least get that going and then i also want to show the high scores on the level select screen and then we probably want to maybe start building our first levels for example um we could also do the slime that follows you and resets the puzzle if you touch you um they could do add saving into the game that's going to be a beast and a half but Anyway, that's going to be all for me today, everyone. I'm going to rest my voice, prepare for tomorrow's stream. So thank you all for hanging out. If I can remember which short keys remove my... There we go. It's, it's nine. Nine does the face palm. Okay. And then seven does this. But anyway, I'm done for today, everyone. Thank you all for hanging out and watching. Uh, if you missed anything on the VOD, the video will be uploaded to YouTube here in an amount of time. Depends upon how long it takes me to download it from Twitch. And then upload it to YouTube, which will probably take an hour or so at the most. Not the most, but at the least. So be aware of that. Um, and if you aren't watching on YouTube and you want to catch a stream, uh, follow me on Twitch. I don't have a set schedule quite yet, since I am... Still kind of feeling it out and getting used to streaming once again. But uh, you can ask questions on stream about things or whatnot. Uh, and also try asking in the YouTube comments. But YouTube's kind of weird for me. It's not showing me notifications properly for things. So I might miss the comments there. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> that's all for me, everyone. Bye for now.